Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. It's been a little bit since we had our last ICT shotgun Twitter space or whatever you want to call it. It's not Saturday like I usually do it. But it's going to be one of those, I don't know how long it's going to be sessions. <laughs> it depends on wherever my uh, impulses take me. If this is your first time listening to one of my live Twitter spaces. Uh, it's probably better if you don't listen to it with children around because I have a tendency to go off and uh, sometimes use colorful language that may not be suitable for children. I'm going to do my best, obviously, to go, try to go through that as much as some of you like to hear it. I don't like that part about me, but for those of you who are veterans or active in the armed forces, thank you very much for your service. Today we're memorializing those that are gone. I was never in the military, by the way. I, I was raised by military folks, and they pretty much talked me out of it. I was going to do the Navy, but I was told otherwise. So I want to talk a little bit about navigating the markets and high probability trading, and I'm going to kind of like revisit some ideas as I go along that we've either touched on or taught in great detail on my YouTube channel and kind of like recalibrate you because sometimes, you know, it's easy for us to get distracted with the everyday chores of running a family. If you're alone or solo, it's still enough for you to be distracted with your own personal endeavors and work and school and whatever it is that you may be having. Uh, that draws your attention or energy, sucks the life out of you. You don't want to study. You don't want to look at the chart. You want something really easy, something one, two, three, get me in and I'm done. And I don't have to think too much about the marketplace. Um, I've tried to do the best I could this year to try to adopt some kind of a teaching approach for the folks that are met with that type of challenge. And I understand that, you know, the more advanced things I'm making available to everyone can feel a little overwhelming. And it's easy for someone that doesn't have a lot of time or is lazy. And I'm just going to be honest, it's most of the time it's that. And sometimes readers or listeners see that from me and it offends them. And they think, you know, who's this guy? I'm not listening to him. He talk, he's talking down to me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the facts. I mean, most of, most of the students that come through my fold, whether it be, private mentorship or public now that I'm teaching for free. Um, the ones that don't make it, they swear up and down that they put the time in. They swear up and down. I saw a guy the other day on Twitter. I'm sick and tired of hearing I haven't studied long enough or I haven't put the time in. When I see that, I mute you. I'll let you see my stuff, but I'm going to mute you because that's just the toxic mindset. You know, it took me six years. Six years. With no encouragement, no one sitting here pouring their insights and encouragement into me. You know, I had uh, the Lord. I, I shouldn't say it that. I sh in terms of educators or teachers or people I bought books and courses and stuff from, uh, none of them made themselves available like I try to do for you. And I went through a lot of emotional turmoil psychological carnage and it was all self-induced but at the time if you were asking me um i would have swore up and down it was that last person i tried to listen to and that's a bitter pill to swallow when you're brand new or if you know you're impulsive or lazy it's easy to say oh it's that guy's fault it's that person's course that messed me up when it's just you trying to relinquish all responsibility and in this industry you have chosen, whether you realize it or not, to take on one of the most challenging things, and it requires the utmost focus and 100% personal responsibility. There's nobody's uh, fault. There's nobody's, um, well, blame 
for anything you do with your money but you. I don't put some kind of hypnotism on you and make you buy or sell anything. And no other educator does that either. If they if they have a wear or a product and you use that as a catalyst to get into a trade and it loses, whose responsibility is that? Yours. Absolutely yours. And it's easy to feel like you're a victim when you're unorganized. And it's convenient for people to, to reach for that as an excuse. Well, it, you know, this guy really is not teaching everything. He's holding something back or, you know, the free trial worked. It, it, it sucked me into it. And then when I tried to use it, you know, paying for it, um, you know, the black box system failed me. You know, uh, that's somebody that is really not equipped to be a trader. And I'm just going to be blunt and tell you that's exactly what that is. And if you're trying to be a trader, you have to understand in the first few years, it's going to be a lot of uphill and it's going to be a lot of hit and miss where you think you have it and then you fall back a few steps. And it's easy if you're lazy. It's easy if you're not committed and not passionate about wanting to do this to talk yourself right out of it. That's why a lot of college dropouts drop out. They're either told by friends and family or influenced by someone that they like. And they say, well, I'm going to follow that person's footsteps. And they start their pursuit of a college degree. And then their first year, they're thinking, this is too much. And many times, just the prerequisite, the, 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 question, uh, the question of whether or not it's worthwhile for them comes up more frequently because they don't like what they're doing. They're not passionate about it. And when I was a working man, in my 20s, I was plagued with this haunting desire to just be out of the normal. I wanted to be something different. I didn't want to be caught in this mundane existence that everybody in my family felt that they were successful because they had a 30-year mortgage on a house and paying 11% interest on their mortgage. And yeah, it's, you know, you're... you're Bitching right now that interest rates are high for mortgages, but you know, I watched my uncles and aunts, you know, buy homes for eighty thousand and ninety thousand, which were at the time they were pretty decent houses. They're not upscale, obviously, but you know, one of my aunts and uncle they owe more, three times more than their house was sold to them at you know at, at purchase price because they have not been good stewards of their money and finances, and they made poor decisions. I didn't want to follow anyone's footsteps when I was coming up. I just wanted to be different. I wanted to trailblaze. And everybody around me did their best to try to discourage me. And that's typically how the enemy works. He'll slip in and enter the mouth of your loved one, your friend, your coworker. And social media has provided a wonderful stage for the enemy because he can slip into DMs. He can slip into a tweet or a response or a reply or a comment section on a YouTube video and steal your joy, steal your pursuit of excellence and your passion. And it's really important when you're navigating these markets that you really do your best to try not to have so much influencers around you. Because influencers, well, Let's just put it bluntly. Everybody wants the attention because the attention equates to clicks and clicks equates to monetized, monetized YouTube videos or eventually a sale in the future. Okay. Many of the things that have been said about me over the years, I've been doing very detailed approaches, but still being in my own lane to try to dismiss all that stuff. For the people that have been here for a long time, uh, they, they don't need to worry about those things because they see the, the fruits and the evidence that all the things that I've been teaching and saying are, in fact, the truth. But influencers, uh, they do what I did and kind of like pioneered it with social media, at least in uh, FinTwit. You know, when in the financial sector of uh, Twitter, you know, I was the bad boy when I came out there, I was in everybody's face and challenging them to do this and show that. And the ones that would talk a lot usually clammed up and you knew they were the ones that weren't able to do anything. And I, I learned that the ones that talked the most shit, they usually were having the easiest crowds to gather. So 
I went upscale on that. Like I went full bore in everybody's face and was like a, a troll. And I knew that the initial crowd would create like a chatterbox. And that chatterbox is viral because if they can create an atmosphere, and I, I promise you I'm going to get to some trading stuff, but it's important for me to set the foundation for this and why I'm even talking to you today. But I had uh, went out there and, and poked the people that everybody looked up to as heroes, and they just got real quiet. They weren't able to show anything. They weren't able to call anything advanced. Um, nothing wouldn't show any executions, but they would give you these stories over their 20 year career. And, you know, the bottom line is, is I understand that that seems like the easy approach. And, and a lot of folks on YouTube or Instagram or Twitter, uh, they like to come in, they like take, take their pop shots at me hoping that they'll get a rise out of me because if I engage them, that gives them an audience. Um, you're going to have to earn your own audience, folks. <laughs> I mean, when you get a crowd, I can bark. I can bark in like a carnival bark and bring people used to look at a, a train wreck scene, okay? Something that everybody wants to come and take a look at. And you may not really be interested in what I'm teaching, but I have a lot of students that came to me by way of drama. And more so by everyone else's drama about me. And that's like the that's the thing right now. The flavor of the month is what can we say about ICT and how we can make his stuff easier, faster, or why it doesn't work when everybody else is making money with it. And I'm here to remind the folks that are influencers. I promise you, come November, your circle of influence will grow. Right now, I'm the interest. But I'm stepping away from it, not because anyone pushed me away, but I want my personal life back. And I knew when I drew a crowd with drama, I had something that would make them stay. You can't just garner a crowd in your influence or your, or your circle of influence on social media and assume that that's going to equate to you having a meteoric rise or more people interested in you. You have to have something of substance. And even at the height of my drama on Twitter, when I would go and poke everybody and say, can you do this? Can you? And I'm doing this with a demo account, folks. I've always done this with a demo. And I've disarmed all of them because they want to come and say, hey, you know, you're using a demo. Yes, I'm absolutely using a demo because I'm teaching. And I'm outside the scope of any legality by doing that because I'm not acting as a financial advisor. We're talking about candlesticks and where they're going to go next. You can't lose money on that. And you can't make money on that. But the people that read between the lines, they say, wait a minute now. If this guy's doing this with a demo account and I learn what he's doing, what could I do with that? Exactly. Exactly. But the, the folks out there that try to compete against me, they'll make all kinds of nonsense up. They'll talk about me in their live, live streams, talk about how I'm only trading a demo. That's not true. I teach in a demo. I teach a lot in a demo because if I'm going to be your educator and I am not influenced or deterred by anyone in social media that says you're teaching or trading a demo account, bro, really look at what I've done with a demo. I don't do any advertising. Everything that has grown in our community is organic. You know what the best growth has come by me not being dramatic. There's a lesson in that folks. The, the internet is huge, okay? And for those that are trying to get their own little thing going on or have been doing it and haven't really got their footing yet, there's such a huge audience. I'm not taking your audience from you. I'm not preventing your audience from seeing you either. I've done nothing except for just stayed in my own lane. And people that come here, they want to learn how to read price action and eventually become their own trader. They're finding that. They're finding me as a resource, a conduit. I don't want to be a celebrity. And Matt, trades by Matt, I saw your tweet. Um, I'm I'm not interested in having a, like a show up and meet and greet type, you know, type of thing like that. And it's nothing against you. I, I get that literally every other day. Either I get it by email, or companies will reach out to me. Brokerage firms will reach out to me. Prop trading firms have reached out to me like that. Um, I don't want to be a celebrity. And if I do those types of things, 
it would appear that's not the case. That in fact, I'd be wanting more attention when I don't want the attention. I want you to learn. I want you to learn how to read price action. So I'm not interested in anyone coming to my home and having a meet and greet. And I'm not interested in going to your home <laughs> or wherever you'd be and have a meet and greet and have an interview. I, I'm not interested in that. I'm really not that interesting. Yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, mystique around me and all that, but I'm just a plain old guy. Like I, I try to live a regular life. I'm blessed. The Lord has richly blessed me. And I just want to enjoy the latter portion of my life. And I don't want to be primarily driven by what these markets are doing or who wants to learn this or that from me, which is the reason why I'm writing the books. So whatever I write in these books, that's my final word on the matter. There isn't going to be like future mentorships or future one-on-ones or any, anything like that. I'm not interested in that. Like I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> okay. I'm tired of it because the world's becoming much more toxic. And whenever you find someone that has something that works really, really well, and nobody else can compete with it in terms of precision, the level of detail that is predictable, you can anticipate, not react. You can anticipate these things in price. It, it makes you feel inferior. And that inferiority complex, you can see it in other YouTubers, other social media entities. And I could have a field day with a younger ICT. Like 10 years ago, oh my goodness, I would be absolutely loving this right now. But I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> okay. I don't want to do it. I, I, I've either, it might be I've grown older and I'm getting in those really fuddy duddy ages or I just lost my interest in it. The, the, the fun and sport in it is, is no longer there. So now when I talk to you, even the folks that say they never watch my videos, but they always come out with something that I've said. It's almost like they pick up my vernacular, but they'll swear up and down. I don't ever watch ICT videos. I've never read a book on day trading. I don't know why people say that stuff when it's not true. It's obvious that, that that's not true. Okay. Everybody in trading has picked up a book. I've read lots of books. I've bought lots of courses. I bought courses from other mentors, people that you probably know, maybe some people you haven't never known before. And the thing that comes up a lot through the people that either have a, ser a service or a source of mentorship of some kind or something in trading, they're trying to you know, market or whatever. They'll say, I've taken things and rebranded it. And the folks that have sat down and did the work on this stuff, and even from the people from those specific areas of, of study, for instance, like supply and demand, everybody insists that order block is supply and demand, and it's not. It's absolutely not. And the fact that there's a change in the state of delivery of price completely removes the idea of any supply and demand factors. Because what you're stating is the price is going up because there's buying pressure and price is going lower because they're selling pressure. And that's not true. It's absolutely not true. But that's what these individuals, even in the financial sector, they have jobs. Okay. They worked for financial institutions. They have learned to parrot those same things. And if they don't talk that way, they'll be slagged in the industry and they can't afford that. I don't care if people agree or don't agree with me. I don't care. It doesn't change the fact this is the truth. This is the way it is. When you come into this industry, you're met with all kinds of enticements. Quit your job. Get rich. Drive these cars. Go to these fancy places. Get finer looking women. Get a better man. You know, all those types of things. And I found out early on, they were not my initial motivators, but when I had a taste of money, the very first few times where I had winning trades and I felt like I had it figured out when I didn't. And that's the problem with having the first few years of your trading. You're going to be convinced that you figured it out. Even if you're having short-term immediate reward by doing something, you may not understand what it is that you did, but you're looking at the fact that you made that money and because you want to feel good about yourself and people like myself, where I felt like I had to prove something to the world because my parents didn't want anything to do with me. My own parents didn't want that. 
and I was I was scheduled to be ab aborted. I wasn't even supposed to be here. But God said otherwise. And because of that, I had a chip on my shoulder. I still do. And the first person that gave me fatherly love and attention was my grandfather. And everything I do in my life, everything I do, I wish many times that I, I could get his approval. And I can't get it, right? So it, it constantly is like a fire under me that just keeps on burning. When I started making money, my position about what it is that motivated me, helped me navigate through all these ups and downs, was that, well, wait a minute, if, if I can make that much money, if I did this many contracts with that type of a move, then I could make $20,000 a month. Well, if I did $20,000 a month, that's like a quarter of a million dollars a year almost. So. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to try to trade more aggressively. I want to make more money because I like how I feel. And if I could start flashing that, showing it to other people, then I would get that itch scratched. And I did, I did all those types of things. And you know what? It didn't work. It was, it was like a, a mosquito bite. Yeah. You felt it bite you and it's pulling the, you know, the little thing it sticks in you to suck the blood out of you. Then you, you either smack it or you start scratching it. Well, as soon as you scratch it, that's it. The histamine in your skin is going to go crazy and it's going to start itching even more. So what I thought was going to satisfy that itch to, to make me feel significant, to make me feel like I've arrived or worth being, you know, here. Like I didn't I didn't find a purpose in life until I found trading. This this was my whole purpose. For being here. I'm convinced of it now, more so as a 51 year old in August. I'm convinced that's why I was here. I was meant to be here. And that it's not arrogance, because I I was resisting that for a long time. Like how did all these things happen where my mother just recently had an abortion right before she got pregnant with me? And it was only a threat by my father to take her life, literally. That's the reason why she gave birth to me. So imagine you come into the world and your parent, your father is locked up in prison for contract murder, doing two consecutive life sentences, plus 20 years, plus pick up more time for trying to escape in the early 80s. He's never getting out. He's going to die in there. And my mother didn't want anything to do with me. So I know what it's like for all of you. OK, that are trying to find your way out here, that you want to feel like you're somebody special, that you really matter, that you have a purpose and you end up having like these. Uh, these montage moments, that's how it was for me when I was a young man, like I would play music and in my mind while I was driving, doing my job, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to this music while I'm driving around. It's going to be like this when I get successful. It's going to be like that when I get successful. When I do this, I'm going to show that person, you know, and you might be laughing yourself. You're thinking, yeah, I do that shit too. I would never tell it to anybody, but, <laughs> but that's, that's what it was for me. And when I taught on baby pips, a lot of the things I taught with my lectures and such, I painted it in a light that it was like an action movie. It was like some kind of uh Tom Can uh, Tom Clancy, you know, type thing, sniper, you know, and it picked up. It got a, a, an audience, and then an audience learned, and they learned how to trade. And other people would ask them, "How'd you learn?" I learned from this guy on Baby Pips, and more people grew, and it just kept growing, growing, growing. And I don't know where you are in your walk. I don't know where you are in your learning. I don't know where you are in the world. I don't know your state of mind. But I've always had this deep-rooted desire to be, number one, identified, recognized. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a minute. You just opened this up by saying you don't want to be a celebrity. Yeah, I don't want to be a celebrity. I, I, don't, like, I don't like just a little bit 
of notoriety I've received. Like it's, it's extremely intrusive. And so many people are clamoring to get your attention and wanting to do things with you. And I don't feel like my life is mine anymore, which is the reason why I'm putting down inner circle trader in November. I'm doing that. No one else did that. I'm doing it. I told you the time it's going to happen and I will be satisfied how I leave you. And that way I won't have this itch that I keep scratching. I know some of that probably upsets you like because you like the things I put out and maybe you like these Twitter spaces and no, I'm not going to do them um, once we're, we're done in November. But uh, the videos on my YouTube channel, I'm not taking them down. A lot of people are freaking out saying he's going to take his videos down. Not, that the whole purpose of putting them out there was so you don't have to buy them from these people that are out there trying to trick you and say that I taught Enigma in my mentorship when I never did. I never, I never will teach that. I didn't teach 90 minute or 90 second or 90 minute uh, cycles. Okay, there's people out there literally lying to you using my name, claiming that I taught this in the forum and this and that. And it's not true. It's absolutely not true. And I put those core content lessons up on my YouTube channel for the express purpose to gift it to the community, number one, two, to prove that everybody else out there that doesn't want to just simply give recognition. Like it's, it's, it's extremely offensive to see people pretend like they found this on their own. There's nothing. Listen, folks. Okay. These are the, this is for the people that like to go in the comment section of other people's videos and say, I rebranded. There's a million dollars. That's a bounty. I have a million dollars that I will pay. If you sit down, go through my core content, go through all my PD arrays. Okay. Go through all that stuff and show us all where I rebranded any of that bullshit. Okay, it, it ain't happening. Okay, all that that stuff that people talk about, it's just to steal your pursuit. And social media has a huge influence over people. Huge. Like I could be way bigger than I am if I wanted to be bigger. I don't want to be bigger. Like I'm uncomfortable. And some of you that might want to be where I am right now, as a 20 year old, I didn't start that way. But about four years into it, this is exactly where I wanted to be at. And I knew I had something. If I made it available to other people, you would all eat it up because it's the market. It is the market. But in those early years, I was fleshing out the things that I had to overcome as a person. It was me that was doing all the damage. It wasn't the tools. It wasn't the concepts. It was me trying to force it when it wasn't there. And you don't realize that you could become a really good trader learning from me. You could become a really good trader learning from anybody else. If they're, if they have something that works, the things that derail you are always internal. They're always internal. There's a, there's a guy out there <laughs> that, uh, I thought I was doing something nice. You know, I, I, was trying to promote him and push him and and I don't know what caused him to flake out or whatever, but uh I'll just tell you this, Pat. Yes, Patrick Whelan. Um, I know you listen to these and I know you watch my videos, okay? And I see you on your live streams bitching and complaining about how you know the number one guru on Twitter trades in demo. You're trading in a demo. When you're trading those funded accounts, you're trading in a demo. You are trading in a demo. That's just the facts. Okay. And what you're trying to do actually is hurting your brand. Like, don't get on there and dramatize about me. Just do what you're doing. And that's what I was trying to push you to do. Focus on what it is that you do. If you're good at trading and you have a model you trust and you can do it, there's going to be somebody out there that it fits for them. Not everybody. Everything I teach doesn't fit everybody. But understanding and reading price, that fits everybody's model. No matter what you do, the way I teach and show you where price is going to gravitate to, if you plug that into anything that already makes money, it supercharges it. I don't sit out here and talk about how you bought a Bronco and it wants to be a Jeep. Okay? I don't talk about all that stuff. 
Stop doing those things because drama marketing does not work. It's it's short term. It gets a little bit of a, of a buzz, a talk, a, a crowd. But unless you have the the ability to hold that crowd and give them something of substance, you fizzle out and it ends up hurting you. It hurts your brand. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm watching you still. But when you do that and you rage quit on your live streams like that, it's not good. It, it doesn't do well for your, your brand. It doesn't do anything for your image. And if you're trying to grow, you're someone else. Okay, someone else that wants to do what it is that I'm, I'm talking about. Drama marketing doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It just makes you look like you're insecure. It makes you feel like you have a superiority complex and you feel inferior. That's why these, these other influencers talk about me because I'm beating the shit out of them. And I'm, a, I'm not even trying to. I'm still right now. I'm trying to be gentlemanly and tell you, don't do that. This is how you help your own brand. Who would do that? Nobody else would do that. I want all of you to succeed. I want all of you to do well. I want you all to make money. Because you're all going to be having a harder time in the next few years. It's going to get stupid. So you've probably been looking at the, <laughs> the way the market's behaved. And early on in the beginning of May, I told you one of the seasonal tendencies I like to have is a sell-off or weakness in the month of May going down into the month of June for stock indices. And if you have gone through the core content, you'll hear me talk about seasonal tendencies and I give you very specific seasonal tendencies. And I got them from Steve Moore. Okay. And I've already shared his website and such, but uh, he doesn't know me. And maybe he does now because I probably put a lot of people on to him, but uh, I don't get any kind of kickbacks. And Steve, if you're listening, I don't want one. <laughs> I, I, I just think he has the superior com, uh, the commodity and uh, well, all the markets really, he covers all of them, but his seasonal tendencies are absolutely the pinnacle. Like that is, if you're going to do anything with seasonality in markets, he is the person to go to. Like he is the man. He's the guy that has the data because the way he does it, it's not form fitted. You know, I have Larry Williams short thing commodity trading book. Okay. And to me, when I first read it, it was like, wow, this is a revolutionary. <laughs> you know, this is the thing. And he was kind of like the first guy to get out there and really put something in the print about it. And you got guys like when I was coming up, it was like Jake Bernstein. You know, he made a big thing about uh, seasonal tendencies. Um, it wasn't until Steve Moore did his product of having like a, a 15 year, a five year, you know, comparing, showing the relationships of how it performed over the, like the seasonal tendency, like for instance, when eggs used to be a futures contract and they don't trade them anymore. But when do you think egg prices would go up? Right before Easter. Everybody would be buying eggs to dye them. And it was just like a, every every year, everybody knew when to buy eggs. And that was the trade that, that's never failed. Well, that same thing existed in pork bellies. And if you eat bacon, then that's where you get bacon from, the pork belly. Well, they don't trade pork bellies anymore either. So, But these thin markets, they were really wonderful markets that had high degree accuracy with their seasonality. Steve Moore brought in a perspective that if he hadn't done it, I wouldn't have even considered it. So I think he revolutionized the whole viewpoint of seasonality by looking at the, the relationship to any seasonal tendency over the basis of a short period of time using the data. How did the seasonality or seasonal tendency perform over the last five years? And then how did it perform over the last 15 years? And then how did it perform over the last 25 years or 30 years? And if you have a seasonal tendency that delivers a specific direction on any, any given market that all three of them are in agreement with, that to me, and, and that's, I'm sure if he was 
talking to, he would say the same thing. That's a very strong seasonal tendency. Very, very strong seasonal tendency. And that was what I did in my core content where I used his, his seasonal t- tendency charts. And I said, these are my favorite seasonal tendencies because I see them as strong. And I go into detail as in, you know, why I believe that. And I show you visually using his product. And I think that if you are going to trade with seasonal tendencies, you should support him as a content creator. I get nothing for it. It's a matter of insight that you really can't get. There's a lot of people in websites out there that have seasonal tendency graphs and such. To me, they're all they're, they're substandard. They're, 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 not, they're nowhere near the degree of Steve Moore and what he does with seasonal tendencies. And frankly, if I was him, I would charge more money. And you're probably cussing me right now thinking, what are you doing that for, ICT? Because his product, in, in the hands of someone that knows how to trade, it's literally like a roadmap. Like it literally, like I can look at these graphs and say, okay, in the fall, at this specific month, I know I want to be a short seller. I want to be a long trader on this month of that particular market. And it sounds like that, that, that can't be. As a new trader, when you first come into this, everything is told to you by books and educators that it's random. Everything in these markets are random and you can't time the market and you have to react to price. And that's absolute bullshit. That's bullshit. You cannot listen to that dribble, okay, and become and adhere to that logic and become a independent thinking, consistently profitable trader. I, I'm convinced of it because I did my utmost best to try to do that. And everybody else that does the same bullshit. That's why the 90% losing statistic exists. But what you don't realize is, folks, listen, as, and I've said this many times in other resources, whether it be on YouTube or in other Twitter spaces, but yes, I absolutely believe this, that the statistics with trading, that 90% blow out really early and it never become profitable. 90%. But what you fail to realize is there's another party on the other side of their trades. It's a net sum zero game. For every winner, there's a buyer. So the paradigm shift that I had was, okay, when I first started, I was absolutely residing in that 90% losing crowd. I was, I was there, and I was buying books thinking that that shit was going to help me. It was going to change my direction. It was going to create me and put, uh, put a path in front of me that was going to be the right one. Now, what I failed to understand is, is if I'm buying that same book, and it's been out there for sale for years before I even started, why isn't that everybody else hasn't figured out what I was going to do, which is follow the rules? And when I stopped buying books, that's when I started learning. When I stopped system hopping and changing my hand of who wants to uh, teach me now? Who wants to be the mentor of Michael? When that, when that stopped and I put my ass in front of the charts and said, okay, I don't know anything. I'm nobody, and I'm at the first step. I'm at zero. What do I want to do? Where is my focus at? Where do I right now, looking at these markets and the opportunities that they present, where do I want to go in this? What can I do with the job that I have? I had a job that I was working. I had to be out in Owings Mills real early in the morning. And the whole workday was really about 12 and a half, 13 hours. So I couldn't be in front of the charts to trade live because I would be all over Baltimore City and Baltimore County filling up vending machines, fixing coffee machines. And even on the way home, I would probably have to be stopping and fixing a machine that someone would call and say, hey, our something didn't work. And my boss at the time, Glenn, would say, this is what you, I need you to do this. And that's it. And so I can't go home and do what I want to do when I'm off. I'm stopping and doing a service call. So I had to come up with a way of determining what the hell it is I'm going to do, which was very difficult for me because I felt like if I could sit in front of the charts and look at one hour charts real time, 
I would be able to do very, very well. But I couldn't have real-time charts while I was driving around in a step van. So the next best thing for me was to get some kind of quote device. So that way I had to come up with a way of determining where I want to be a buyer because I wasn't a short seller in the beginning. I didn't understand short selling. I was afraid of it. And it didn't make any sense. How can you sell something you don't own and make money, right? <laughs> it's like, what the hell's that? So I wanted to be a buyer only. So my model was buy model only. And what was the, the driving force behind the decisions that made me a buyer? I was looking at a 9 and 18 exponential moving average on a daily chart. If the nine day moving average, now I don't do this now, folks, so don't take this as the gospel, okay? But I'm just telling you how we have changed, okay? We've definitely evolved. But when I first started, it was a nine EMA exponential and a 18 day exponential moving average on the daily chart. And I had a 50 day moving average that was just a simple, not even exponential. So, what I wanted to see was that 50 day sloping up. I don't care how, you know, if it was a, a gradual slope, if it was higher than it was 20 days ago, to me, I'm looking for longs, but that doesn't give me the buy yet. I wanted to see the nine day being above the EMA. I'm sorry, the nine EMA above the 18 day EMA, but it can't, can't just cross it. I can't do that. I have to wait for it to cross. Then it has to spend at least three days above the 18 day. So that in my mind, momentum is absolutely going long. Now, I did not get the best entries. I didn't catch the lows. I was afraid of trying to do that because Larry Williams said, don't go in trying to catch falling daggers. So I, he was my mentor. So I said, fuck that. I ain't going in and doing that. I'm going to wait for it to be moving and I'll get in sync with it then. How did I do that? What was my, my entry mechanism? In the evening time, when I finally found my way home, did my exercising, and then ate and then showered, I would spend all night long, sometimes going to work, doing that same schedule with less than three hours sleep sometimes. Oh, come on. I, I'm telling you. You think I'm, I'm an insomniac now. I don't require a lot of sleep. I don't know why people think they got to be sleeping their whole fucking life away. But eight hours sleep to me, you're wasting it. You're wasting it. You would probably do so much better if you get to a point where you can not have to have a job. Do small sessions in sleep. Like I do two, four-hour sessions. They're broken up. And then I catnap in between when I, when I can. I get so much shit done. That's why some of you, it's like, do you ever sleep? Yeah, I sleep. I schedule sleep. But I don't have the same cares of the world like you do. Like you worry about losing your job. You worry about making sure your kids have your college funds. You worry about how you're going to put food on your table because your job may not require you anymore and make you redundant. So I don't, I don't have those fears. And when you don't have those fears, you're energized because that shit's like a vampire. It sucks the life out of you. And it's difficult. It's so hard in the beginning doing this because you have all those real world cares of the world. They're, they're real. You're, you're not exaggerating it. Believe me, I ex experienced all that stuff. But for me, the desire to get the fuck out of that shit was more than any of the fear. I had to do this because I couldn't exist living a mundane existence. I can't, I can't do that. I'm not wired for that. So I had to go in and look at one hour charts. In the evening, on end of data, end of day data, that means this is when it wasn't even real time. I was downloading my data using Metastock. That, that was the platform I used for my charting. Metastock was a, um, a charting package, kind of like TradeStation or uh, Supercharts. Supercharts isn't a thing anymore, I don't think. And uh, TradeStation is still around. They've evolved into a, a broker, uh, broker. But uh, Metastock was... That was my joint. That was my, that was my weapon. And I thought I had everything figured out with that shit. And in the beginning, I had every indicator you could put on a chart and you couldn't see my candles. Well, I didn't have candlesticks in the beginning. It was open, high, low, and close, but you couldn't even see price. I didn't give a shit because the indicators, I thought that they were the, the trick. That was the thing. Don't look at trite. Uh, don't look at price. That's the distraction, right? <laughs> when in fact, it's the indicator that's the distraction. Okay. And that's why I thumb my nose at that shit because 
I fell victim to all that stuff. And yes, there is absolutely a way to use indicators and use my content and make money. Absolutely, you can. But the problem is, is you end up falling into this trap. And yes, I'm getting to the point about what I was looking for on the alley chart. Settle the hell down. But you get caught up in this rat race of finding out what indicators you want to have, what their settings are supposed to be, and which ones are better at doing what. So there's all kinds of books written about. And if you buy 12 different books about indicators, rarely will they agree on the settings. Rarely will they agree on how to use them and when they apply them. But they have an ability to go back in time and find the cherry picked examples of where the shit worked perfectly. But then when you go out there and you try to do it, you're wrecked. I went through that shit for years, convincing myself every, sing every, every single time that I failed at doing it. It was just, okay, it, it's the right indicator, but this guy doesn't have the right settings. I'm going to buy another book or another course, another DVD, okay, that talks about it. And they will give me the part that this guy left out. And it never worked like that. It never fucking worked. So I was like, you know, there's so many holes in this industry. So many opportunity for people that would know how to do something. Why don't they come out here and simply just produce something that works? Like it removes all the bullshit, cuts right down to the bone and says, okay, no fluff, no indicator. This is what price is going to do. And I don't give a shit if you believe it or not, because this is how it's going to be. And I said, I, I can't find it. I'm looking around. I can't find anybody able to do that. So I'm going to be that. That was my passion. I'm going to fill all the potholes in this industry where the shit doesn't work. I'm going to fill that in. I'm going to give you something that works. Not just it works okay. It is absolutely precise. Down to when you can expect it to form. What days, what months, what markets, what direction, what time. All that shit was my passion. But it started with a very simple little bullish divergence when the market was oversold on a 60-minute chart. What, what market was that? The bond market. The bond market. I segued from currency futures into bonds, like my second year. And I was like, well, I like bonds. They trend real easy. Like, they're nice. Like, they, when they start moving, they just tend to move for a good period of time. And I wanted to be part of a momentum. And currency trends... They were great, but the problem was is their gaps were scary. Like they were, I, I wasn't able to hold anything overnight because I was not aware of how Globex traded. I wasn't aware of you know overseas how that time difference and what markets are behaving like at that time. Yeah, you know, I was brand new to all that stuff, so I was afraid to touch that. So if I did any kind of trading in, in uh, not index but currency futures, I would do it as a day trade only. And I would get out many times way before the market would close because I was afraid. I was <laughs> stone cold afraid of doing it wrong because if you were in a market and if you look at a currency futures contract back in the 90s, uh, sometimes it would gap a lot. And if you were holding on to something, you could wake up and be completely decimated. So that scared me. So I said, well, I'm, I'm going to be focusing and specializing in bonds. So I want to look at that market. So my model really began on the back of 30-year treasury bond. And I would use a 60-minute chart. Now, mind you, remember the daily settings would be this. The 50-day moving average, which is a simple moving average, it needs to be sloping up, okay? That's all it needs to be. The nine exponential moving average needs to be above the 18-day exponential moving average, but it has to be there at least three days above it. You can't just cross it. We're not treating it like a moving average crossover or a golden cross. We're not treating anything like that. It's really moved. And then what I did was I was looking for 60-minute or one-hour oversold conditions that presented a bullish divergence, a typical, you know, standard bullish divergence where the chart would create a lower low in price but the stochastic i was using which was a 14 smooth by three three that was my settings and if it if it created a bullish divergence i would be looking for the opening price at open which is the reason why i had the quote track i'm, I'm watching that and i get the opening price and i would wait for it to trade 
just a little bit below the opening price. And if it did that, I would buy five ticks above the opening price. Thinking I'm buying strength. Where did I get that from? I got it from Larry Williams. He buys strength. He, you know, he was buying on stops. And that was my model. I didn't understand buying limits because I didn't know where I could place my limit order. Because I was afraid if I put a limit order in and it filled me and it went further down, I didn't know how to place a stop loss yet. I was all brand new to this, right? So when I caught a runner, man, it was great. It was amazing. But when I put the order in, the stop loss, because you got to put in an um, order canceled order. Okay, so it's parent contingent, meaning you call your broker. This is how we did it back then. You call your broker and you say, okay, I want to buy uh, Christmas bonds, which is December contract of 30-year treasury bond, and at this price. Where's your stop? You want to use it th outside. Do you want to use a stop? Yes. You tell them how many ticks away it was, okay? And I would use a 10 tick stop. So it's about 300 some dollars per contract. And in the beginning, it was just one contract I was trading. So I would have no target. I would just wait. I want to see how price behaved. Sometimes it would fill me and then stop me out. And that would wreck my whole fucking day. I would be half ass filling the machines because I was mad. I'm mad. So I'm just like you. OK, I'm just like you when you when your shit doesn't go right. You want to you want to blow up. You want to show the world that you're pissed off. Don't you don't want them to ask you what you did wrong, but you want them to understand you're pissed off. I'm having a bad fucking day. Don't talk to me. So I would be driving around all through Baltimore City and Baltimore County, filling up vending machines, pissed off that I couldn't see what it did. And then I would go home that evening, go through the process of doing my normal thing. Work out, get all the stress out of me, take a shower. I've already ate. Now I'm looking at the charts and I could see these things start happening. Like if I would have saw that on the chart, I could see how I wouldn't have bought there yet. I would have done this. I would have done that. And that sounds like, oh, it's hindsight 2020. But you know how I trade now. I can tell you, honestly, when if I would have done something, I've done it this year. I did it last year, too. Telling you, if I would have been trading, I would have I would have got stopped out there if I would have done that trade. It's not a lot. But in the beginning, it was a lot. I did it wrong a lot. With no encouragement, like I'm giving it to you. So it's normal for you to feel like you're spinning your wheels in the beginning. It, it's going to be like that with whatever you do in trading. Because you're competing with yourself. You have an expectation of yourself. Whether you want to admit it or not. You want to see yourself somewhere in the future, whatever that timeline is. You're presenting this as a goal for yourself. And you're manifesting that as your, your destination. When that destination is going to evolve so many fucking times over the next several years, what you think you're going to be satisfied with is going to change a lot, especially when you start finding consistency and profitability. That shit's going out the window. Forget about it. Like you're, you're going to completely change how you think about yourself, how you're going to live, what you're going to do with money, how you're going to spend it. Like It's all going to change. If you don't know what it's like to make six figures. You don't know what that feels like. You don't know what it feels like to make seven figures. You don't have that. You don't know what that feels like. But you also don't know what it feels like to lose seven figures. For some of you, that's the end of the fucking world. That's it. I'm never touching this market again. I'm never going to do it again. But that's just a lesson that you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to go through the ups and downs of what you think you understand and what you really learn from going through it. That was, that was the ICT model. That's what I was doing. And then I realized that there were some trades that were forming that would escape my observation. I wouldn't be able to anticipate them. And the things that led to me understanding more about that was comparing the five-year, the 10-year, and the 30-year bonds. Comparing them while they were trending lower, I'm looking for a, a, an opportunity to go long. Well, I noticed that one of those yields would diverge. And I'm thinking to myself, every single time that this thing happens, there's some measure of an intermediate term price run that forms, and it gives me an opportunity to find a move. So I want to be able to study this and go back in time, and does it exist a lot? And I found out that that's, in fact, what was occurring. And now you know through core content, that's my bond uh, 
the triad, the, the divergence, the SMT divergence for uh, the bonds. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, if, for instance, say the stock market goes to shit, okay, or it stayed in a really choppy garbage range, I would just go over to bonds. Like, I can go back to where I started. That's my home, okay? I moved from bonds to trading S&P because I like the volatility that S&P would give intraday. Bonds were a lot smoother, a little bit more. Hang on one second. I'm in the Highlander. It's shut off because uh, I've been sitting here. I need the air conditioning. It's a little too warm in here. But I moved from the bond market and started exploring the opportunities that the index features were uh, offering. And I would trade the the stock market the same way I was doing the bonds. If I was bullish, I would allow for you know the opening price, get that opening price. I'm already bullish, so I want to see it try to trade down below the opening price. So even if it's you know, going down a little bit, I don't care. Five ticks above that opening price, I'm buying strength. And then if it was good, it would just run off. And if it was bad, it would stop me out and then I'd be like anybody else, losing their freaking mind about it. Blaming myself and blaming everything else. You know, I should have did this. I should have did that. And I hurt myself by doing all those things. And this is the reason why I teach all of you when you're journaling or if you're talking on social media about what you do and what you've done. You don't want to be negative because you're reinforcing this whole idea about trying to be perfect. And perfect doesn't exist. I mean, it exists in Christ, but you're not going to be here. And you can't do that in trading. You're going to lose. Sorry for the folks that have headphones on. <laughs> Got to move away. This dude just pulled up next to me. He's just like steady staring at me. I don't do autographs, bro. Get away. So, while I had a heavy required indicator based strategy in the beginning, I obviously evolved away from all that stuff. And there's a way of using indicators, yes. But I don't think that uh, a new trader should go there. They should learn primarily naked price action. And you'll develop your own tools, which is what I've done over the years, and things that you can apply to price, but not necessarily manipulate price. Like I don't have anything that like measures rate of change. Like I don't use any kind of CCI. I don't use any kind of overall oversold, no stochastic, no RSI, no, none of those things. They're measuring rate of change. And whatever you're doing with those indicators and whatever input you're using, for instance, like I was using a 14 day. At some point, it moved from 14 period to 10 period, and then nine period smoothed by three three on a slow stochastic. That's what I that's what I had, and then I would use a nine period Williams percent R. And I started noticing that sometimes the Williams percent R would give me the oversold condition that I was looking for, but the stochastic wouldn't. But it would start running off, and I'm like, "What the hell just happened here? Like, it, it shouldn't have done that." It's supposed to listen to this indicator for fuck's sake. Why is this doing that? I wasted years doing them, arguing why the market wasn't listening to this indicator. And that's what people do when they get in these indicators. They get pissed off. And you see them on their YouTubers. They're live streaming. Just watch them. Read their face. They're disgusted. Oh, man. That's the trade that they got in they didn't tell you about. Okay, that's, that's it. That's the one that's burning them. Okay, But then they'll say, oh, yeah, I took a trade here. I got long here. You didn't say you got it long then. You didn't do that. You did not do that. Okay. So there's a difference. I'm calling shit beforehand. I'm telling you where it's going to go. So don't be comparing me apples and orange bullshit. Okay. But you're going to get wrapped up in all this indicator pursuit and waste so much time. So much time doing that. When I first teach students under my wing, the first thing you're doing is take everything off your charts. Take everything off your charts. Completely naked, open, high, low, close, or candlestick. That's it. Then you're going to study price in relationship to time. When do intraday moves occur? When do intraweek moves occur? Is there an influence that you can set a clock to, which is the economic calendar, 
all of that built into what you anticipate is going to happen on that weekly chart. Is the weekly chart most likely going to expand higher or is it more likely to expand lower? That right there sets the tone for what you want to focus on going forward in the new week. Do you think that the, the market is really close to a target that you've been watching? If that's the case, that it might go up and expand to a premium level or a higher time frame resistance point, okay, something like that for folks that are brand new, don't know my terminology, then you would anticipate some measure of potential intra-week reversal. But sticking with the narrative that it's not advised to try to pick tops. I don't try to pick tops, but it allows me to formulate a game plan that if I'm bullish, for, for instance, uh, we, were, we were bullish on NASDAQ, and I took your attention to a very specific gap on the weekly chart. And hopefully I've dispelled all the confusion because invariably people in my comment section, you can't see the comments in the new videos, but I've, it's, it's still a, a sugar coma. You know, <laughs> it's all love basically. But the few people that are questioning, they're saying like, you know, why am I using the June contract and not the continuous contract? If you're looking for volume imbalances, you need to be using the contract month. Okay, that's a characteristic for that specific PDA rate, which is the reason why I get pissed off when people try to pre pretend they understand and go out and try to make courses with it. You don't know what the fuck you're doing, so stop. The continuous contract is too smooth, and it's not going to offer the opportunity to show the inefficiencies that exist in thinly traded contract months. And what do I mean by that? Well, right now we're trading the June contract of E-mini S&P. In a couple weeks, it will roll over, and as traders, we will roll over and start following the September contract. The whole time, December is being treated too. Thinly treated, but it's being traded. The inefficiencies in price action on those months in the future delivery, while we're trading the front month, the front month right now for ES is the June contract. The next month out is September. So you would be having a study of ESU, U is the symbol for contract delivery month, September, and then 2023 on trading view. For December, it would be ESZ as in zipper, 2023. And that would be your symbol for December contract for S&P. They're not going to mark to market perfectly the same. They're not. And when they first start becoming available and traded, there's going to be this really gappy, inefficient price delivery. When you blend that with the present day narrative, which is essential in understanding where price is going to go, and that's what I teach, and that's something that needs to be mentored. You can't, I can't write a book, okay, and tell you in a paragraph or a chapter, this is, this is just the be all end all. This is how you do it. There's so many supporting things that you have to learn, which is the reason why this is expensive. It takes a lot of time to learn this, not just by me, Anyone, anyone that goes into this industry and wants to learn how to trade and they think they can do this shit, learn how to be consistent in a couple months or a one week workshop. I have so many people reach out to me. Hey, can we do a workshop? You know, we'll fund it. We'll put the put the whole thing together. You know, it'll be a 60 40 split. I get 60. They get 40. And all I got to do is teach. They do all the venue management. All I got to do is be there at the time and, and do it. Everything, all that shit, marketing, all that shit's done. That is them. I'm not interested, folks. Like, if I want to make more money, all I got to do is put a price tag on something. There it is. It's done. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do it. Okay? But if you understand that if we are taking our short-term expectation on price, placing that in the context of what higher time frame price action is doing, all the things that you're wrestling with right now, it diminishes. Not entirely, but it diminishes greatly because you're looking for higher time frame perspective to unfold. That's a macro perspective, not macro in a sense of like the short little algorithmic things I'm talking about. Macro perspective and micro perspective. Macro would be weekly, monthly, intermediate term would be daily, four hour, and then short term is one hour or less. And then obviously micro is we're in the five minutes and less. So there's, a, there's an hierarchy in price delivery. And what you might see in one time frame as bullish may just be a future retracement 
into a longer term cell model. In 1995, I had my ass handed to me on uh, Swiss Franc. I was looking at a weekly chart and I was expecting this to be some kind of like a bull flag. And this is how the, the fake bull flags became a thing. <laughs> I, uh, I was trying to go long in Swiss Franc. I actually uh, told some of my friends, look, you know, I'm going long in Swiss Franc. You know, this is what it's going to do. I think it's going to go up this much. And what I did not understand is that it was simply going up into a small inefficiency that I understand and teach you now. And it was going to go lower and a lot lower. And that was one trade that I wrestled. I, I was convinced it was going to move for me. And I kept opening up my stop, kept opening up my stop, kept opening up my, my friends. They got stopped out. I was holding on to it because why, why, why did Michael rookie sensation ICT, <laughs> why did he think that it was a smart move to keep opening the stop? That means I was widening. Okay. Wherever I had my initial stop loss, protect the initial entry long. I was like, okay, I, I know I'm right, but I'm probably wrong where I'm placing my stop. So I have to just sit through a little bit more, open it up more and more, a little bit more, open it up more. And I was like, okay, now this thing's looking like it really wants to go down to go right to my stop. I'm going to just take the stop off. Well, that's when it fucking tanked. Okay. And I experienced $6,000 per contract. That's not fun. That's not fucking fun. Okay. Especially when you're not in front of the chart seeing it. It's just changing numbers. <laughs> okay. It's changing numbers on the screen. So I was like, okay, this is bullshit. Um, I got yeah, this. This is painful. Well, that lesson, that pain, that uncomfortable state would have taken many of you out of this and say, I'm never doing it again. Was I embarrassed because my friends saw me lose big? Yeah, absolutely. I was fucking totally demoralized. But I turned it around. I said, okay, that's never going to happen again. I knew I was wrong, but I arm wrestled it. I knew I was fucking wrong. I was under the pressure of the market's thumb. And it was giving me all the time in the world to save my own neck. And I wouldn't listen. I came in with my preconceived notions that this is what the market's going to do. I married the vein. I sold my soul to that trade. I was not going to let go of it. And it punished me. It tore my ass up. And that's that, that gapping feature that I tell you about that I was afraid of, that's where I learned that lesson from. Because the Swiss rank just kept going lower. And then in the next session, I'm holding over. It just gaps further against me. I'm like, what the fuck? Clearly, it's got to be done now. Nope. Four days later, I'm still in there. No stop. No stop. And account gone. So back to saving money. Working on the weekend. Delivering pizza. Getting some scratch capital raised up again. And I had to go back in and do it all over again. And the only lesson I learned from that at the time was don't hold overnight on for, uh, futures and currencies because the gaps are too much. That was the only lesson at the time that I learned. But now knowing that what I know now, there's so many things that I understand about price action that I would never have gone long now. As the trader I am right now, and it's not because I'm hindsight 2020 and everybody could be saying the same thing. I know things that I was falling victim to and I was not paying attention to it because I was unaware. I was unaware. My understanding of commitment of traders was not what it is today. Just simply because the commitment of traders were showing long positions by the commercials. You know, that was weeks before. Weeks before. They had switched to, to being bearish. Net short position. That means if you're looking at commercial traders on a net trader position chart, they had more contracts net short than they were net long. So that means that they were shorting where I was buying. And I was that retail Rick that got his ass handed to him. And I learned years later to look back at that and say, oh, shit. 
this is one of those millionaire mega trades. And I didn't even see it or recognize it. So understand, this is the guy that you're learning from. Okay. This is the guy that has more understanding today that in the beginning, at that time, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was learning all this stuff right then and there. I was learning it. You're having that same right now, that experience right now, but I'm giving you insight that isn't taught anywhere else until they learned it from me. But you can't get it watered down. You have to understand there's a lot more detail to all the things I'm teaching. And just because you're introduced to the idea, don't fall victim to thinking you're ready and go out there and risk money because you're going to hurt yourself. And that small little hurt, that small little loss incurred, and all losses suck. They do. They absolutely suck. But in the beginning, every loss isn't a paper cut. It's like having your arm cut off. You're losing an appendage. It, you make it like that. You, you increase it to that level of influence, impact. When it's nowhere near the degree that you really think it is, when you have experience, you look back and oh, shit, that was nothing. You're going to have a whole lot of paper cuts. Sometimes a little bit of gash here, gash there, put a stitch in it, staple it, shut the fuck up and keep going. Do the same thing you've been doing because you just did one small mistake. It doesn't change the model. It doesn't make the model inefficient. It doesn't make it ineffective. It just means that you messed up as the operator. Own it. Move on. Don't dwell on it. Move on. But if you have flawed logic right from Jump Street, you're going to lose your ass. And you're going to be miserable at the end of it because you're going to remember all the times that you subconsciously knew that you should not have been doing what you're doing, but you didn't listen. You couldn't bring the, the, the amount of strength and discipline that's required to simply say, I'm getting out of this. This is wrong. I'll worry about making the money back at a later time. But right now, I got to stop the bleeding because that's the first rule you got to do. Learn how to stop yourself from losing your ass. You're going to lose money, folks. That's a guarantee. You're going to lose money. Every trader. Every trader loses. They do. I have learned where I lose the most, and I try not to trade in those instances. In April, I took road trips. I said, fuck this. I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to get out here and call something that I know the probabilities are so low for me to be accurate. Why? Why feed the trolls? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to practice what I preach. If I don't see some reason for me to be in front of the charts, I'm getting the fuck out of Dodge. See ya. I'm out of here. I had a lot of fun. Relaxing. Spent my time with my family. It was great. And then I got back home when I felt things were changing. You were told in advance where we were expecting the NASDAQ. You were told where we were expecting the euro. The dollar. They behaved exactly as I outlined them. You can't change that. You can't discount it. You can't say it wasn't real. It's not hindsight. And it's not cherry picked. It's 100% understanding. And to answer some of the folks that were crowing to me, can you teach swing trading? Can you talk about higher time frames? I don't want to look at a one minute chart. It's just, I'm never going to trade a one minute chart. Okay, that's you. But that same idea of understanding what price does and how it delivers, what makes price book the way it does? You can study hundreds of examples over a course of a few months in one minute data. And that same logic being applied to a daily or weekly or monthly chart, it's, the still, it's still the same thing. It doesn't feel like that could be the, true, but it's exactly what it is. Because price, here's, here's the major discovery that I had that was a major epiphany. I thought that the market was independently doing things you know, randomly all the time when, the, when it's not, it's not doing that at all. It's working from higher time frame charts down to lower time frame charts. It's trading to where liquidity is resting, obvious below old low, below old equal lows, or above old high or above relative equal highs. That's liquidity. Okay. If you have already ran that liquidity, and you, for instance, let's make the argument that you're bearish, okay? You're bearish on a market and you want to get short and you go into price data. Look at a weekly chart. It supports the idea you think it's going to go lower. Daily chart looks like it wants to go lower. You can clearly see where it would like to likely draw down to. Some old low or relative equal low. You want to look and see, has it 
gone into buy side recently on a daily chart, a weekly chart, or a four-hour chart. If it has and it's sharply moved away and started going lower, you are in right now a sell model. That means it's already started its movement. So someone that we're going to deem as smart money, someone short, their interest in this is for it to go to an opposing pool of liquidity, which is what? Sell side. So your first objective is to look for low hanging fruit. You want to go to a weekly, I'm sorry, you want to go to a 60 minute chart, find some relative equal low or single low that has not been traded to recently. There are sell stops resting below that. That's this market 101. You don't need to read books to know that. It's simple logic. If it moved up from there, chances are someone's holding a long position and their stop loss is right below that low. So the market's going to, go to gravitate to that. If there's a large fair value gap, some kind of a buy side and balance, sell side and efficiency that's below that, then you can view that as I'm taking a partial at that short term 60 minute low. And I'm going to try to get into the high of that buy side and balance, sell side and efficiency, the highest point, which would be like an institutional order for entry drill. If you were long or bullish, we're not doing that here. The example would be making the argument that we're looking for lower prices. You would look at the highest point of that buy side and balance, sell side and efficiency, and then the equilibrium price point. That's how I would treat it. And then I would wait to see, does it want to move lower? I would use the consequent encroachment of that BISI to trade short if it was supporting the idea it wants to move lower. I would not be trying to trade the full closure of that buy side and balance, sell side and efficiency. That separates me from the people that think they understand that, oh, it's, it's going to go there because gaps have to be filled. They don't have to do anything. Those gaps can stay there for a long time and they can stay there longer than your fucking equity can stay in your account trying to trade to get that gap filled. So there's rules to this. Okay. There's levels that are understanding and engagement has to be defined and you have to be disciplined. Like you have to know what you're looking for and it has to be in writing. Like when I, before I do a trade, I have an expectation of where I want to see it go to. It's written down. Same thing I'm having right now. I have a small little notepad, and these are levels I'm looking for. It won't mean anything to you. I know some of you are like, can you show me it? When you do that, can you? It's literally just me writing down a price. That's it. In my mind, I know why I wrote it. If someone picked it up on the street and said, oh, you know, this is ICT secret instructions. It's not. It's just these are areas I believe that the market's going to draw to. In my head, I have the narrative in mind as to why it would do that. I'm not, I don't have time, dude. I'm trading, I'm trading on a one minute chart, sometimes less than that. How, how long does it take you to write down? Uh, I believe that uh, 4111 and a half is sell side liquidity. And fuck that. If the market's already gone, it's left. It's already left the station. Elvis has left the fucking building. It's gone. You can't do that kind of stuff if you're trading. You can't, you can't journal as you go. You journal after the fact. But when you're studying and tape reading, you just mark down what you think is likely to draw to. And you do that on your chart. Like you do that on your chart. So that way it's there. And then you study what you have seen. Did it really do that? How did it behave when it did it? How long did it take to do it? Did it go there and just fall short of it in reverse? All these things are worthwhile studies. But. Some of the best seasonal tendencies are the ones that fail. I mentioned that in core content when I talked about seasonal tendencies. And that was an observation I really found on my own. Um, I'm not trying to take credit for it or try to make a big deal, deal about it or be dogmatic about it. But when I expected certain seasonal tendencies to behave a certain way in certain markets, when they failed on me, they did it in stunning fashion. Like It was really something to be doing the opposite of. And that was a major help to me when I would lose money trying to go long with what I believe were seasonal tendencies. When I got my ass handed to me, I grew to trust the fact that I can be a short seller because of that pain. When I was taking a loss in a series of losing trades, trying to force my will on a seasonal tendency that I thought like. Don't look at these seasonal tendencies as a panacea. They're not be all end alls. They're not going to be cast in you know, stone where it always works. They don't always work. And while I wanted to see the indices 
present that opportunity. When I was going through social media, everybody was expecting it to go lower. Even the news was talking about, oh, stock market's going to go down. Stock market's going to do this. And stuff. No, I'm aware that the debt ceiling was an issue. I was aware of all that stuff. We talked about it. But the technicals, the price action was showing us that it wasn't willing to do so. It was it had unfinished business on the upside. So because of that, we've been maintaining our focus on going long. And for the folks that don't pay attention, you see them. They're the same individuals that tweet like, but what about the seasonal tendency, though? I thought we were supposed to go lower, though. OK. There's a. There's a measure of common sense that you're going to have to use when you're learning this, especially with me, because I don't have patience for stupidity. If you are not paying attention to the fact that I'm looking at these markets and calling higher prices. I'm pointing your attention to this particular level. I'm looking right there. If it does this, it's going to come down and treats this fair value gap as an inversion fair value gap. I think it's going to go up to this buy side liquidity. It's going to go up to this premium volume imbalance. Does that sound bearish to you? If it does, you missed the plot. Go back and start from square one because I wasn't trying to get you in shorts. I was taking your attention, pointing to those weekly imbalances. Why? Because that's the macro perspective. That macro perspective sets the tone for the market is willing to do the opposite of what I wanted to see. Well, I wanted to see the fair, uh, the I'm sorry, the seasonal tendency. I wanted it to materialize, but because it was stagnant, it was just chopping around in April. While I was down there, sitting on the beach, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? It would be just like them to not send it lower. So where would I want to look for if price wants to go up? I need to take a look at that weekly chart again. And then that, that's what I shared with y'all. None of my tweets get del del deleted. They never get deleted. I don't edit them when I mess up and fuck up something or I misspell something. It is the way it is. Okay. Go back and listen to the, the Twitter spaces. Okay. People take them and they put them on their YouTube videos or channel and they monetize them. I don't give a shit. Make money on it. I don't care. Don't take my videos. And folks, Travis 4X. I'm letting you know your channel is about to get the fuck pulled down on YouTube. I did not give you permission to translate my shit into Spanish. You cannot take my fucking videos and translate them. Okay. I don't give permission to none of that shit. So your whole fucking channel is coming down. It's done. So when I took you through those mindsets of looking for seasonal tendencies, I was not forcing my will, which is what I would have done as a 20 year old. As a 20 year old, I would have been like, yeah, it's season time's gonna work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. And I would have went into what the media and the news have been saying. Oh, the debt ceiling's not gonna be raised, or we're gonna default. Personally, I'm gonna be honest with you. I wish we would fucking default. Because that's what it needs. This whole system, okay, just needs a fucking enema. It needs an enema. It's the stock market should not be where it's at right now. OK, it absolutely should not be here. It is. Uh, it's not sustainable, but you can't look at that from common sense perspective and apply it to charts. You got to look at who can we hurt the most. And since the public wanted to sell short. Uh, one of the ladies that follow me, she's one of my students, she's like, um, is it time for the season te seasonal tendency to come in with lower prices? And I said, no, I think we need some more altitude first. And we climbed. And then when I told you that it created that immediate rebalance on the daily chart, that really is like a supercharging to it's going to really ram up their ass. And look what they did where we opened up on Sunday. Huge, big, exhaustive gap. NASDAQ went way up into that real liquidity void, that gap within that weekly charts volume imbalance, that little sweet spot. And the whole time Dow has been sleeping. It's just, you know, I got. I got better things to do. <laughs> I'm catnapping. I'm not interested in that. S&P has moved up. But you were told that NASDAQ was the strong one. Well, ICT, if that was the case, why was you trading NASDAQ? Because I'm taking you into one market. And that way, you're, you're going to specialize in one. Whether you like it or not, you're going to eventually gravitate to one or two markets. You're probably telling me right now, bullshit, watch this. I'm going to trade 28 pairs. I'm going to be the, the ghost in the Forex. <laughs> you're going to get your ass ghosted. You got to narrow your focus, folks. There's not a, it's not a 
It's not a disadvantage to do that. It's advantageous for you to do it. Your attention cannot be diluted, especially if you're going to trade the way I'm teaching, because your attention needs to be 100% adhered to one instrument or a very closely correlated instrument. Because if you look at multiple things, and a lot of you are like, hey, can you talk about gold? Can you talk about crude oil? Can you talk about Bitcoin? Can you talk about this? And that? I mean, I, I don't have the attention span to be able to do all those things. I can't. Like, my, my mind is racing a thousand miles an hour. And there's so many thoughts that's trying to get in front. And so many things I want to say to you, so many things I want to teach to you, and things I want to do. And I'm wrestling with that. So if I have more markets to talk about, I won't be effective as a teacher. That's how it was when I was doing mentorship. Everybody wanted to add more to, can you talk about this pair? Can you, can you just fucking listen to what I'm talking about in this one? Because what I'm teaching you in this one works in all of them. It works in all of them. So just slow your roll, roll your sleeves up and say, okay, he's giving me what works. I'm not getting the flavor that I want, but it still will fill my belly. And I'll learn how to do this on my own market of choice after I learn how to do it with what he's teaching. That's the proper mindset with me. It's not have your way mentorship here. Okay, we're, we're, we're not doing to let's let's take uh, requests. That's, that's not how this works. Okay, to be effective, I have to do what it is that I know and not be distracted by it because I'm easily distracted. I'm very easily distracted. And maybe some of you have experienced that, you know, trying to learn this. It's easy for you to want to be doing something else, you know. And that's why I facetiously say sometimes, you know. Put down the game controller, put down the bonbons, put down the potato chips. I need you to really pay attention to what I'm about to say because if you don't listen and adhere it to yourself as a trader or a developing student, you're going to be hurt by it later on and it's avoidable. So in that time period of being away and taking the road trips and such, I thought to myself, you know what? If I really wanted to fuck people over I would go after this idea of sell and man go away. And I would really flood the market with uncertainty. The debt ceiling's not getting raised. We're going to default. Oh man, the stock market's going to get decimated. Every, every doom and gloom prepper trader fucking channel out there was telling everybody the stocks were going to crash. Nope. They didn't crash, did they? They rammed right up into a level I told you they were going to go to. So, what made that price action going higher energetic like that? The fact that it was opposing the expected result. The expected result would be stocks should go lower and it's sell in May and go away. Now, that's not to say that we can't sell off right here or tomorrow. And that begins the whole typical May seasonality. It's just it wasn't in the cards technically to go lower. And I'm not trying to pick the top, but I'm satisfied with where the NASDAQ is. So. When I say things like that, immediately the infants in learning how to do this will come up and say, and I say that not to be mean, but you're an infant when you want to go, okay, well, now what? Look at the guys and the gals in the comment section or replies to my tweet and such. And I see it all the time in my comment section. The same five or six people. Okay, now what? Now what's going to happen? Now what's going to happen? Like, dude, what the fuck? It just moved over a thousand points. Over a thousand fucking points that not one YouTuber talked about. Not one of them. And I guarantee you, secretly, some of them have been fading me, hoping they can come back and say, he said it was going to do this. Blah, blah. And guess what? You got your ass hurt, didn't it? Your ass is stretched out now. Ain't I'm trying to help all of you. But I'm teaching you practically based on what we're seeing in the chart real time. Where is it going to go next? I could do that all day long in one minute charts. All day long. All day long. Every, every major fluctuation intraday, I can be a part of that up and down. I get losses from that. I will incur losing trades by doing that, but I can play that all day long. Making $19,000, $20,000 over the whole week using multiple contract or, or accounts of demo. You know, I can do that $19,000 in fucking one session. I don't need your bullshit. <laughs> okay. So when you look at these other folks out there, they're going to try to distract you from learning this because this is going to help you and it's going to minimize what they're doing. Their strengths are going to be reduced 
by your ability to do this without any indicator, no crutch, not one fucking thing needs to be applied to your chart except for your own notes and annotations. And that flies in the face of the majority of everybody on YouTube. More people is going to join the hate wagon, okay? They're going to because they think that's going to be a way for them to overcome this monster, this Frankenstein ice tea is. I'm just an average dude, man. That's it. I'm trying to help all of you. I'm not victimizing any of you. I'm not coming after your YouTube channel. I'm trying to talk shit about anybody. And when you do that kind of stuff, it makes you the wrong kind of influence. Like our community here, everybody that sells a service, they'll say our community sucks. Well, they say that because they call bullshit when they see it from their YouTube channel. And they say that price is being bought up and buying pressure sends price higher. When you know differently now. But they don't like that because it goes against their narrative. Their, their selling points are those things, those features that appear in books. So it goes without saying, of course, they're going to say our community is toxic. Because we're calling them bullshit. They're not doing the right things with the markets. Even if they're making money, they're attributing their happenstance being right. And I've had lots of that in the beginning. And these folks are 20 years old. They're fresh out of high school, most of them. And they're teaching. What the fuck are you teaching? What not to do? That's what they're teaching. Don't do those things. Hey, I'm, I'm still here. I'm just looking. It's, it's, what the hell is that? That's got to be a drone. <laughs> Hang on. I'm not sure if I can do this while I'm talking to you. Let me try. Oh, yeah, it's definitely a drone. So I find a drone. The, um, I was like, oh, shit, I got me a UFO. <laughs> Tin foil hat, but came out of nowhere. That shit can happen anytime. But anyway, the, uh, this, this journey of yours, okay, this journey that you're going through, you're going to have peaks of mountains that you're going to, you're going to reach the top of and you're going to feel like you've conquered everything. And then you're going to keep going forward. Well, if you're at the top of the mountain, what's going to happen? You're going to have to go down. Keep going forward. Well, that means you're going down, but you're going to view that going down period as the end of your career. And you start pushing too hard on your trades and forcing things. Forcing, forcing things that aren't in the chart. So what I did was I used the information that I gleaned from pain, blown accounts, real psychological warfare that I put myself through. No troll can say anything to me that would be more painful than I've already done to myself in my career as a 20-year-old. Nobody could do anything to me. Nobody can do anything, say anything about me that make me fucking lose sleep. I don't give a shit, okay? But you as a new student, whether you're learning from me or anybody else, you're highly influenced. It's so easy to manipulate and, and, and you're malleable. Like you're, you can be manipulated to the point where bad news about anything that you're trying to do will convince you quickly. And you'll use that as a perfect excuse to say, okay, it's too much effort. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a fraud. It's definitely a scam. It's, 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 this this stuff doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work when it does. You just simply haven't put the time in doing the right things. Okay, there's people out there that spent a lot of time doing stupid shit, watching videos only. You got to be in this, looking at the price action, studying it, going through the process of measuring how much drawdown the trades occur. How often does these fair value gaps form? I've literally removed all of the fucking guesswork and reduced it down to a 60 minute time window. Okay. 60 minute time window, gave it a cool ass name, the silver bullet, because that's what you're looking for, a fucking silver bullet that never misses. Okay. If you understand narrative and you know where the next draw on liquidity is, you have a 90% likelihood of making fucking money if you know how to trade and use that model. There's nobody else out there can say that shit because their indicators, they don't know when their indicators are going to change and say it's overbought, oversold, or it's a diversion. They don't know. They're a victim of that shit. They're waiting for that train wreck to happen. They're waiting for it. I am telling you where this shit's going to explode. I'm telling you where it's going to go to. I'm telling you what time it's going to form. What guessing game do you need to make now? What guessing game? Between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. 
every fucking day, there is a gap that can be found from a five minute. If it's not on a five minute, where do you look? Okay, drop down to a four minute. Oh, I don't see a gap there yet. Let me drop down to what? Three minutes. You learned that in a 2022 model. Some of you are pretending like you never even watched that stuff. You didn't You didn't figure that out yet? You have to go down. You, you're doing a top-down analysis on intraday chart, on micro-market analysis. Five minutes. That's your high time frame on intraday. When you're in the little time frames, you know, five minutes is like a fucking weekly chart on a 15-second chart. But I don't want to trade that way. Then don't fucking trade that way. But use the information on the higher time frames. You guys bellyache. The, bell, the, the people that do bellyache, you're bellyaching about things that I've already addressed. If you just simply watch the videos and kept good notes, I've already talked about those things. But you're fucking lazy. You, don't, you want me to take you to the video at the minute marker and save you all the time and effort of going through it properly. And you learn more going through it the normal way. You think that one thing you're wrestling right now is going to be the thing that makes it better for you to start making money. That's not how it works. Because when you learn something new, 20 more fucking questions pop up. You know, what that, you know what that's called? That's fucking progress. Okay? That's progress. And you're afraid of it because you're stepping into the unknown. You're stepping into a field that is extremely technical. And all the results are contributed to your decision making. Your execution you're pushing in the button you're not or placing of a stop loss the amount of leverage that you're applying to that trade that's all your fucking fault it's yours you need to own it i'd never sugarcoat that stuff and the people that bellyache the most are the ones that are doing all the wrong things and they're thinking that there's something new i'm going to teach that fixes that when it's you you are that was me when i was younger i did all that same stupid shit I was the reason why I was blown as accounts. It wasn't the market. It was me. I knew what I was doing most of the time was wrong right before it would stop me out. And I still wouldn't get out because I was arm wrestling it. Well, I had a perfect opportunity, a perfect stage set for me right now, just recently in the last six weeks or so. I introduced what I like. I would like to see the seasonal tendency pan out. I would like, I said that. I said it in Twitter spaces. I said it in a YouTube video. I audibly made myself and talked about it in tweets. But if the market in itself is showing us it's not going to do that, I'm not that same 20-year-old neophyte. I'm not the guy that's wrestling with his emotions about being right. I don't need to be fucking right. It's actually better. It's better when I'm not right. I can teach you when I'm messing it up. I'm a human being. If I make a mistake, how are you going to deal with that? How does ICT deal with it when he does it wrong? Look at what I did on Friday. Like 11,000 something, whatever it is, in terms of trading up and down, up and down. And I forced myself to take shorts that I know that could potentially pay out. But the bias was what? Reaching that weekly volume imbalance. I even type it out. This is not a short. You're all going to see it. So I'm communicating that. Yes, there's a short there, but it's not the short that I would really want. I want to be long. And I showed you the history, every little trade, every little thing that went through. And I think it was like nine hundred and seventy-five dollar uh, losing trade there. But on the grand scheme of things, it's nothing on that day. You wouldn't even feel that if every one of those trades were made by you. you would you be worried about that nine hundred seventy-five dollars that it would have been a loss? For some of you, it's like the end of the fucking world. It's the rock in your shoe. You can't go any further. You can't, I can't do this anymore. It's, it hurts too much. You're not ready. So how, how do you fix that? Go back into back testing. For the guy that sent me a tweet this morning. It said, uh, what do I do if I'm able to see the draw on liquidity? Well, first of all, you got to understand, are you able to do that or are you using mine? Because if I'm calling the market direction and you're falsely attributing it that you can do that, because many times students come to me in the early stages, they think I'm ready because I'm lending you my experience. I'm giving you my 30 years of experience reading these markets. That way you can decide on where you think the market's going to go. You, you can ignore me. You can fade me at your peril. But I'm telling you where I believe the market's going to go next. And look at it. We've been doing it for a couple of years now publicly. And you decide, is it, is it accurate? Is it accurate or not? If it is, 
that's what keeps you here. That's what keeps the, the community growing. Because if I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, I would be canceled already. Be like, this, this guy's going to fuck he's talking about. You see it. You see the evidence of it. But are you really able to see the next draw on liquidity? If you are, what model are you using? What's the multiplier you're using? What PD array are you using to get into a trade? Is it always changing? As a mentor, I discovered that many of my students wanted to force a specific PD array. And it's usually in the beginning, it's the order block. The least taught thing that I've done, that's the thing that they want. Because everybody doesn't know what the fuck they're doing with it. And I've already said this. That will not be released until it's in a book. Because it's been already been abused poorly you know, from other people. You don't know what an order block is. Okay. It has nothing to do with level two data. It has nothing to do with the size of orders resting in the market. It has nothing to do with that. It's a change in the state of delivery where the market turns from a buy model to a sell model, from a sell model to a buy model. I have not taught that to anybody. My charter members don't know that. They did not learn that, okay? They have been introduced to an idea. They, If they were all in a room right now and I said, okay, raise your hand as a private mentorship student. You're all charter members. Raise your hand if I taught that. Nobody would raise their hand up. Raise your hand if I said you've just been introduced to it. There's more lectures coming on that. They would all raise their hand. So stop believing these fucking people trying to sell you shit. I got the secrets from ICT's forum. He taught this. He taught Enigma. I am never teaching fucking Enigma. Enigma. It's not going to be taught to anybody outside my fucking family. My children are going to decide whether or not they ever gets taught. Maybe one of them will sell out their soul <laughs> and make it a book or make it a course or whatever. I don't give a fuck. You know, it's their, it's their decision. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm on a really long rabbit trail. I gotta take my notes here, make sure I'm on the right path. <laughs> so uh yeah, we talked about that and talked about the model. And um the the content that I've already released. Um I hope you guys can appreciate me just talking to you like you know, we've known each other for a long time. Because this is how I would talk to you if you were right next to me. If you were doing one-on-one -on -one with me, this is how I would talk to you. I wouldn't sugarcoat anything. I would be honest. I would tell you where I made mistakes. I would tell you what I learned from those mistakes. And I wouldn't hide from it. Because that's, that's where the real learning occurs. But so many of you are perpetual ICT students. And you don't realize it. And I understand that you like what I do. And you like how I do it. And it's great concepts. But don't lose sight of why you are learning. You're all waiting for the next thing to be taught. Just like the folks that always say, when it delivers to where I think it's going to go, and the market goes to whatever level I've outlined publicly, and it does that, they're the first four or five people that show up in my comment section or reply to a tweet and say, okay, what's next? Now, here's one of the, it's either one or the other. It's somebody that's waiting for me to get it wrong, and they're going to cheer, you know, champion that all over the internet he said it was going to do this and it did that okay or they're just somebody that wants to always be in the marketplace and there is a period of time between trades that you have to get real comfortable with that period between not engaging when the market delivers something that you've anticipated like we we just watched it unfold in the indices we watched it unfold in euro dollar dollar index OK, so I did things in Forex for the crowd that loves Forex and know me mostly for, from that. And I've stayed true to E-mini S&P. I said I was going to focus on E-mini S&P. But before we even started this whole parade, I told you NASDAQ was the, the one. And if you're trading NASDAQ, keep your focus up on that weekly gap inside that volume of balance. And we gapped up into it today. Beautifully. I'm satisfied. Now, what does that mean? So that way you understand, you put it in your notes. That means I am literally neutral. I hold no bias right now. What do you mean you don't hold bias? Come on, ICT, you're holding back. No. I enjoy the period of time when I have expected the market to perform a specific way. I submitted myself to that whole time. I didn't arm wrestle it. I bask in it. 
I peacock around in front of my wife about all the time. <laughs> you think I'm being funny? And I am. I'm fucking really doing it because I want her to see what I do that she thinks is a video game. Like this is a hard, this is hard. It isn't a fucking video game. This is something that takes a lot of skill, a lot of attention, a lot of effort, focus, and you're wrestling with yourself. And on social media, I have all kinds of assholes constantly coming over here trying to promote some idea that would be opposing to whatever I'm saying, hoping that they're right. And most of them are falling on their face. And I just let them talk. I, I'll mute them. But you don't ever hear from them again. They stop talking their shit. And I go check and see what they're doing. And they block me. <laughs> but I do this to, to rub my wife. I'm like, hey, look, you know, I, you know, I said this is what's going to happen and this is what it is. And she's like, unimpressed because she thinks it's fucking PlayStation. Like it's, it's some kind of Xbox fucking game. <laughs> so when you learn how to do this and you get your victories, learn to bask in them. That's not ego. You're going to need those moments to lean on when you go into periods of drawdown, you got to be able to remind yourself, man, it felt really good to get this right. To do everything in the analysis as I was taught, and it performed exactly as I was expecting. This feels good. You need to set up a tent and live there for a little while. Not just say, okay, next trade. That's where you get your ass handed to you. Every, listen folks, listen real, real fucking close. Because this is the truth. Every single time. Every single time I blew an account came immediately on the heels of something like we just experienced where I did something right. It performed the way I was expecting and went to target and that that sugar high wore off and they wear off fucking quick. You think you're like, oh, you call a thousand point move. Does this, does that, does this, you know, all these wonderful feelings. You get the butterflies, you share it with your friends, you show your coworker, you show your boss, this is what I made, so that way he knows that your fucking pittance of a money paycheck you give me is nothing to me. It's literally fucking less than one handle on the S&P for me. Go fuck yourself. That wears off fast. That wears off real, real fast. So what do you want to do? You want to get another hit. You want to get another drag on that joint we call the market. Smoking's bad for you. Don't do that. Smoke the markets. It's healthier. So don't rush. Don't rush to get back in there and do something right away. Because what you're feeling is withdrawal. You're all hopped up on fucking goofballs. You did something right, which is great. Champion that. But live there for a little while. Take a week off. You just did something amazing. What most people fail at. You adhere to one rule which is stick to the model. Don't get caught up with the media. The media was saying, oh, the market's going to crash. Mm -mm. I would like to see it happen. I would like to see us default. It would be painful as shit. It would be a wreck, carnage, every fucking where. But that's exactly what should take place. In a real free market, that's what should be happening. And it's not. So? You got to keep taking your buy signals. If the market's saying, I'm not going down, then the best pain threshold will be met by going higher. Now, here's narrative. This is where we transition from just market macro perspective talking in generalized commentary to now specifics. Where we have a seasonal tendency that even the general populace knows that, you know, if you're a trader in stocks, usually it's the sell in May and go away. I would like to see that form. But what is the chart telling me? There's a weekly volume imbalance. Everything I've taken you to into the charts, because the charts tell the story. Fuck the media. Fuck all the reports. I don't even know what those data points say. Like when CPI comes out, I couldn't tell you to save my own ass what any of that information was or what the, what the data was. I could never tell you. I don't care. I don't care to know because it's all bullshit. It's all fake. It's all manipulation. They use that as a way, of like a, a magician. Okay. If I was standing in front of you, I'm pretty good. Uh, sleight of hand. I could take something, place it in this hand, and you'd swear up and down that I placed it here and it would be in my other hand. 
And while you're looking at that hand, I'm dropping it in my pocket or switching it with something else. And then the reveal would be like, how did you just do that? Well, that misdirection, that's what these reports are, folks. So if you've never really got the, the gist of why I talk about the economic calendar, it's not because I'm a fundamental trader. Because fundamentally, I think it's flawed to think about it fundamentally. I'm a technically minded trader. I believe that the charts are telling you in advance how they're going to hurt the people that believe the bullshit. So if you're a person that likes to trade with fundamentals, <clears throat> that will wreck your ass on these intraday charts because they're going to do something. And the easiest thing to do is to study, go over to Forex Factory. Okay. Go over to Forex Factory and click on any one of the news drivers that are high impact or medium impact. Okay. And when you do that, click on the information that tells you how to de determine what it means. If this report, comes out and the high, if the number's higher, it's good for the currency or it's good for, you know, whatever, or it's not good for it. It's negative. You expect it to be lower in prices because of it. How many times does it do that? It's 50, 50. Don't take my word for it. Go back through the data and see it for yourselves. So if it's 50, 50, what fucking use is it to anyone to even worry about what it is? So you got to look at the technicals and you got to ask yourself this question, which is what I teach. Who can be hurt the easiest? Where's the shortest line to pain where profit can be made? When I look at charts, I'm looking at victims. That's what I see. Okay. I see stop loss orders that are easy to take. I see inefficiencies that needs to be revisited to and still keep the context or narrative underway that's in price action that n normal retail traders would not expect it to be. Because they're looking at charts with patterns or they're doing th things harmonically. They're looking for Fibonacci ratios to only match up this point. You're looking at animal patterns and all these other things that they're believing in as a religion. And all of those things I factor in. Yes, I understand harmonic trading. Yes, I understand all that other bullshit, Elliott Wave. I understand all that stuff. And when I look at charts, I can see how they're wrong. And when smart money will roll on them. So without needing to teach you all the bullshit, Elliott Waves, supply and demand, harmonic patterns, all that dumb shit, I take you right to the narrative, that PD array matrix. It saves me so much time not going through the shit that's going to bog you down. Because right, I'm getting right to the point. You don't realize I've gotten to the point. Every time I talk to you, it's right to the point. But the problem is, is where I take you, it's uncomfortable. You want it to be easy. You want it to be right now, real quick understanding. And it's not like that. But the people that put the work behind it and they say, okay, I'm looking for one model. I'm looking for this type of trade. And I'm going to simplify it by only looking for this thing right here. What is that? Could be the breaker. Could be the model in 2022. Could be that. It, that's it. It could be the silver bullet, which now is removed the whole idea. When does it form? When do you look for it in this? And when, it's offered to you in London session. It's offered to you in the New York session in the morning. And it's offered to you in the afternoon and in the New York afternoon. There's three fucking opportunities per day. What are you doing with it? What are you doing? Have you gone back through your own charts and studied it the same way I've been teaching it to you? Remember, if the fair value gap forms or if it doesn't form, rather, on the five-minute chart, you drop down to the four-minute chart. If it's not on the four-minute chart, you drop down to the three-minute chart. If it's not on the three-minute, you drop down to the two. If it's not there on the two, you drop down to the one. If it's not there on the one, you drop down to a 30-second or 15-second. Whether you trade it or not, you study it because you're teaching your mind. Your, your brain, here's, here's what you're not realizing. When you're looking at price, you're not telling yourself, okay, this is a 60-minute chart, and it only works on a 60-minute chart. Your, your brain's looking at these candlesticks and you're running through this rush of emotions. It's going up, it's going down. You want it to go down. But every time it goes up, you're thinking, it's probably going to fail. It's probably going to be one losing trade. I got this stupid fucking demo trade on. It's going to be a fucking loser. I'm wasting my time with this shit. You're not doing it right. You might be doing a lot of that and saying, I've been studying a lot. Fuck you, ICT. I'm not been, I'm, I've never been putting enough time in. You. I'm tired of hearing that. I'm tired of you pissing and moaning. How about that? How about that? I'm tired of listening to the same 
couple people bitching about how they don't like being told they're not working the right way. You got to work the right way. You got to follow the fucking rules. If you don't want to follow the rules, of course you're not going to get the results. Of course you're not. You can join a gym. If you never take your fucking ass there, you're never going to get fit. Just because you show up and listen to me talk, you're not lifting the fucking weights. You're not pushing. You're not putting the effort in. You're not doing the repetitions to the degree of failure. Mus muscle growth comes by failure. You got to take that point where you can't do it anymore. When it's failure, then you've caused damage. The muscle says, okay, fuck this. I got to get stronger. Build more muscle. Well, your brain is the muscle with this. You have to build it up. That means you have to go through that really boring shit. You got to listen to lectures like this where it sounds like I'm chewing your ass out and I don't want you to succeed. When I do want you to succeed, it's, it's your perspective. If you want to come into this as a victim, you're going to see everything and you're a victim to it. The way I teach, you're victimizing the unlearned. You're victimizing the neophyte. They don't know how to fucking trade. They put their stop loss in the wrong place. We're running on them. We're not running in a pack like a wild animals, okay, trying to find whatever thing, whatever moves next. That's reacting to price. Fuck that. We are a cheetah. We know we can run any fucking thing down. We can run anything down. Put whatever fuck you want to put in front of us, whatever method out there, we will run circles around that shit. Nothing can fucking beat what I'm telling you. I'm nothing, nothing, nothing can beat this. Nothing. If it could, it would have came. It's never come. You are a cheetah stalking in the high grass. And there's a herd out there. They think they're safe because they're close. They're all doing the same thing, eating the grass. They're hanging around, the same people, doing the same shit. Harmonic, retail, Elliott Wave shit. You're the cheetah. You're sitting out there in the long grass. You're just waiting. You're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And you see that one gazelle just takes a step too far out and puts his stop loss right there easy for the taking the herd is going to move away but that one animal that doesn't know what it's doing it doesn't shift when it should and now there's a fair value gap in 72 miles an hour in seconds your ass is there pouncing on it that's what I'm envisioning in price. Do I know that person that's losing money? No. Do I know the person that has all their hopes and expectations of making money on that trade? Do I know them? Do I, am I going to see them? No. Am I worried about them? No. Do I feel bad that they lost money? No. I have to eat. You have to eat. Everybody signs the same risk disclosures when you come into this market. Everybody understands that you can lose and lose more than you have. I have no qualms about it, period. It's the way it is. It's a jungle out here. You either are prey or you're a predator. I don't walk around or teach my students to be a, a lamb. This is the way it is, folks. You have to have teeth and you have to have claws. And you need to know when to use them and how to use them. You want to come in here and play the nice guy role and everybody, you know, is going to love you and you never say anything wrong or never off color or whatever. Bottom line is, that's not what this is. This is fucking war. We're talking about money, real money, lots of it and major entities out there that do not want you to be doing this successfully. They're going to roll on that. And I'm teaching you how to beat the fuck out of that, <laughs> okay? Consistently, to be able to just constantly walk in there every every single week. You go to work. Do you have to learn your job every every new every new week that you go there? Do you have to relearn your job? No. You know what you're doing. You're fucking bored. You can't stand being there. It's the same thing for trading. You need to get your trading to be just like that. And for the folks that are struggling, you can see the draw. I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a moment let's say for a moment that you can determine the next draw on liquidity you can do that all by yourself without me wonderful i'm proud of you that's that's the number one thing is if you can do that you will always find setups but if you can do that 
And you can see how trades form, but you can't execute on them. How do you fix that? Well, you don't have a model. You just have a familiarity. That, okay, the market should be turning here. Well, what do you do? Well, what is it telling you? Is there an order block? Is there a fair value gap? Is there a breaker? Is it institutional order flow entry drill there? Is it, good grief, is it um, optimal trade entry? You know, any number of things. Is it an Artemis pattern? <gasps> my nod to my charter members. <laughs> oh, shit. Here comes a whole new wave of videos by everybody on YouTube. The ICT Artemis trade. He never loses. That's bullshit. <laughs> the guys that are out there saying you never lose doing silver bullet trades, you shouldn't do that. That's false advertising. Okay. You're going to have a losing trade. Don't, I never said that you're never going to have a losing trade. But you're going to find consistency using silver bullet because it's time based. And it's always going to form. Every single day, it's there. The problem is, is you want it to form on your favorite time frame. You want it to fit your already established expectation or preconceived notions about what price should do. And you're not following the rules. So yes, you're doing shit wrong. And you're not getting the results. And that's expected, right? If I give you a recipe and say, this is the ingredients, this is the order you do it, and this is what you should expect as a result. And you substitute something. OK, you leave a key ingredient out and replace it with what you think is better suited for that. You're not going to get the same result. And don't complain that you didn't get the result that was promoted by me that you should be getting if you're doing something outside the scope of the instructions and parameters I've given. If you come to me as an educator, as a mentor, you're trusting me enough to give me your attention initially. So why don't you fucking follow the rules that I've placed in front of you? You're failing. You are failing, not me. You are. So you have to change that shit. It's, it's always going to be you. When I mess up and when I fail, nobody's fault but mine. That's accountability. You have to be accountable to yourself. And some people just don't want to be accountable. They want to have the luxury of being able to blame somebody else because they fucked up. They didn't do something right. And in this industry, guess what, Jack? You don't get that luxury. It's always you because I don't run a fucking signal service. If you make money, congratulations. You did it right. Well done. I am proud of you. If you lose money, eat that shit because you did it on your own. What do you mean eat that shit? Learn from it. It's hard medicine. It's a bitter pill. Swallow it. It's going to make you better. It will make you better. It's going to make you the trader you want to be. You think that it's always going to be the sugar highs that make you the best trader that you're ever going to be. Give me the stuff that works. I see. Fuck all the bullshit. You're going to learn from all the cuts. The abrasions, the bruises, the losses. That's what I learned from. And you're going to learn from it too. But you have to allow that to happen. You can't tiptoe around thinking, I'm going to avoid losing trades. You're not. Because the more you try to do that, it's going to land right in your lap. But every single time I blew out an account, it was on the heels of a good run. And I wanted to feel good again. Because it was wearing off too fast. The same fucking hour. Walking around like, oh, man, shit. I made more money than I make a whole month. A whole month of work in this bullshit job. I made more money than that in this one fucking trade. Man. Like, if I just did that once a month, I don't need to have a job. Yeah, that's great. Oh, it's wearing off. I gotta do it again. And you think that you can just go into the market and find something like that again. Forgetting the fact that it just took you two and a half, three weeks for that price run to continue to complete and go to its target. You're, you get tore up by the chemical imbalances in your brain when you win. And you don't even know what that feels like yet because you haven't done it yet. You haven't won. You haven't found consistency. And when that achievement is reached, you have a whole new le level of learning to go through. It's something. Folks, it's a learning process to grow accustomed to being profitable. It sounds like it's something. There's no way everybody should have no problem adjusting that. No, it's weird. I don't know how to. I don't know how to articulate it where it would make sense. I, I've wrestled with this topic for a long time to be able to, to teach it to students, and that's why I say you'll know when you go through it. You'll know exactly what I mean because there's no way for me to articulate it in words to make you understand. That it is extremely stressful making money in the beginning. 
when you when you find consistency and you find profitability, it's stressful because first of all, you want to do more of it when you do it. And you, you're going to have to wrestle with that. Do I, am I over trading? Am I, am I pushing too much? Am I trying to push the edge too far? Am I overstaying my welcome? And you, you're, you're going to have a whole new learning experience that you haven't ever even considered yet because you're not even profitable. I promise you, if you ask anybody, do it. Ask anybody that's found profitability if this isn't true. It's a weird, it's a weird state of mind because it's like it's too good to be true. That's what it's like a dream light state. It's it's like a that's the, really the one of the topics in the title of my one of my books, uh, the chapter, a dream like state where I do my best and I already know because what I have in outline isn't going to be satisfying. But it's enough to introduce you to the idea, which is what I'm doing here. When you find consistency and profitability, it's going to feel like at any time it's going to stop working. And some of you already have that mindset that come to me all the time. Aren't you afraid that you're teaching this and the market's going to adjust to that? What the fuck do you mean it's going to adjust to it? This is the market. This is the market. This is exactly what the market does. So the market's not going to try to do something it doesn't do. This is what it does. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're who you are. You're who you are, and that's just the way it is. You can't be a dog. You might try to say you identify as a fucking dog, but you're a fucking human being. You are a person. This is how you are. You can't be something that you aren't. The market isn't going to stop being this way. That's why I tell you all the time. Unequivocally, there's no way. There's no fucking way that this is going to ever change. It's never going to change. Never. It's never going to change. You doing it wrong. That's going to happen. You losing money doing something incorrectly, that's going to happen. But if you know how to trade and you learn how to control yourself, a losing trade or two or three, okay, stop. Recalibrate. Let me get my bearings again and then go back to doing what you're supposed to be doing. But you have to learn how to pause. Pause when you're losing money and pause when you made money. It's not like you want to go out there and get another hit and get high on success. The people that succeed that are long-term consistently profitable, they know when to sit still. And that's a very hard thing to teach. It's, it's hard. It's hard to teach that. So I just come up with general rules. That when you have a really good, nice run, stop. Be content. Live there for a little while, a whole week. But there's so many other trades. Yes, there is. The market's always moving. But you're insisting upon doing something because the availability is there versus building a foundation of mental capital that's the that's the point you can have whatever you want to have in your funded accounts or your real accounts but you really aren't trading with that you're trading with what you're willing to lose in your head that's real that's the that's the threshold that you don't want to ever cross what does that mean say you have a ten thousand dollar account you have ten thousand dollars in your trading account and you know you think two two percent you can take that well if you're new two percent is too high Way too high. But let's assume that that's what it is. In reality, you're uncomfortable if it gets to 1%. So you might initially put your stop loss there at what would be considered 2%. But as soon as it starts approaching that 1% threshold and draw down while you're in the trade, that's what causes you to collapse the trade. So what's your mental capital? 1%. That's your real capital. Have you considered that when you're doing your, your trades? Most of you probably haven't. That's a secret that unlocks performance that you've never even dreamed of. Because when you excel in knowing where your threshold is and you say, okay, I'm content with that. That's why I always said, be content with enough. What is enough? It's going to be uniquely different for all of you. $15,000 winning trade may not be significant for some of you. For other people, that's a whole year. For and I'm done. I ain't got to do shit now. So it's a, it's a matter of personal preference and where you are what your expectations, what your skill set pro provides for. But your mental capital, the way you build that up is when you have the victory like this and it's, it's done well. And you may have never taken a trade on this. But remember, in your journaling, you're going to be recording it like you saw it coming and you did. You're tricking your brain with pseudo experience. 
So you're always constantly laying down foundation psychologically because this is where all this battle is won. It's not in the chart. It's in your head because you can talk yourself out of a winning trade easily. And you can talk yourself out of a short term drawdown that will eventually pay out if you just stuck to the model and what you're trying to trade. But your mental capital needs to be increased. How do you increase your mental capital? Because you can't deposit mental money. It's experience. That experience factor is something that goes largely untouched in terms of teaching. Mark Douglas didn't talk about it enough. He didn't really get to the grasp of you have to fortify yourself between trades. When you've done something correctly, sit still. Feel what it feels like to be content, not needing to go to that next trade. How do you know you're ready to go in and trade with live funds? How do you know when you're ready to do a, a funded account challenge? When you're not driven by the passion to get into a next new trade. If you're the person or persons that always tweet to me when I'm calling something out and it delivers, you're the first person in the line that says, what's next? What's going to do next? You're not ready, bro. <laughs> you are fucking not ready. You're a fiend. You're literally cracked out. You're, 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 you're equivalent to having a crack pipe in your fucking mouth. And you're literally out of rocks. And you want to get the next one. You're, you're fiending. You're not ready. You are absolutely not ready. The people that are like, yeah, I'm going to take this week off. What the market's going to do is, yeah, sorry. That's someone that's got the right mindset. If they're already consistent in terms of what they can see and forecast and price action, and they can take themselves away from the market, even when they know there's something coming, that's maturity. That is a, a skill set that if you can forge that before you press into real money, that factor of, well, discipline, it will serve you so well. But you all think it's just the stuff in the chart that's what you need. The new ICT gimmick, the new something set up or model, whatever. And it's not. I've given you shit. I've given you so many things already. But you are the missing final piece of the puzzle. And you don't want to believe me because it's painful. I'm going to constantly remind you. Every time I talk on the Twitter space, I'm reminding you sometimes gently. But in this one, it probably hurts a little bit. It probably feels off-putting. Don't hate the don't hate the messenger. Okay, I'm I'm Doctor ICT. Okay, I'm telling you, this is the medicine that you need. It doesn't taste good, but it helps you. It makes you better, and it's important for you to grow and understand how to do this correctly and not hurt yourself. That's why I teach in a demo. Because if I teach in a demo, and I go out there and I show you what I'm doing, because the misnomer is this. If I'm the number one guru on Twitter, right, Patrick, um, and I'm trading with a demo, I don't trade with live money, I'm already loaded. I don't need to prove people I have made money in the marketplace. I don't need to do that. I'm calling it. My students are making money. This stuff happens. That's all that needs to be known. That's the only thing I promise, that you're going to learn how to read price action. I did not promise you profitability. That's something that you individually, you individually control. But if I ha if I'm out here in public, in in the mode of a educator, and I have no emotional commitment that holds me back about using a demo, then you should have no problem practicing in one. If your mentor is operating and teaching through the medium of a of a demo, I don't listen to these jokers out there that have something to sell. Oh wow, he does this and he does that, and they're not even doing anything close to what we do. Their whole month, I could do that in one fucking day. One day. From beginning to end, show you the whole fucking history. Done. I don't need to do that. I don't have a little dick complex, okay? I'm completely content with who I am, how I am, and my own length. I don't need to worry about anything else. So when you're looking at this, don't view what you're doing as a demo is not significant enough because it is significant because you're reading price. The same price action that's unfolding in that demo is happening for people that are trading in real money. The real money people that did everything opposite to what you were doing are expecting in price action and lost their ass. Believe me, they know for fucking certain that that shit just happened to them. I'm teaching you so that way you have no emotional connection to this. You have no connection to it emotionally. So you can't be swayed 
in the periods where it will do its damage. You can't get all, you know, egotistical because you're not you're not making any money. You're not getting taxed. You you can't go out and spend those demo dollars, but you're getting that experience, and you're allowing yourself to learn what I'm teaching you. When you get it right, pause. Feel what it feels like to get it right. Give your journal time between entries where you executed and your next trade. I'm not convincing you or I'm trying to talk to you into taking trade after trade after trade after trade to fill your journal up. That's not what this is all about. It's quality over quantity. And just because I'm teaching you the skill set through the medium of day trading, it's not every day trading. There's recklessness out there and people gravitate to wild cowboy type shit. And I've done that stuff and I, I fell victim to it when I was coming up. I saw people doing some crazy stuff on America Online. I was like, well, I want to do that too. And I got hurt. And I, I tried to force myself to learn what it is they're doing and I couldn't do it. So I just stopped. If I'm not able to bridge the gap for you, I'm not the best mentor. Okay. I've said this many times before. I'm not the best mentor. I'm sure in years to come, someone's going to properly learn what I'm teaching and they're going to do a better job of coaching other people. Okay. Until I'm done, that can't happen. But November, we're done. I may not be able to fulfill that need that one of you or individually, some of you that are listening, I might not be the person that can deliver it. It might be one of my children later in, in life that, that they decided to go that route. I don't know. I'm doing the best I can. I have limitations as a person. I have things I wrestle with and I'm a real person. So I'm practical. I know that I'm not going to reach all of you. And it hurts me because I try very hard, very, very hard to try to do whatever I can to allow you to understand what it is that you need to know and to eliminate the things you're worrying about. And it frustrates me when I see people not listening to the sound advice that I wish I would have, I would have paid whatever I had to learn how I'm teaching you. Like I'm trying to be, because I know what it was like. I lived it. I mean, I, I know 20 year old Michael. I, I mean, I'm that guy. And if I would have had this, it would have done so much for me. It would have encouraged me when I needed it. It would have kept me aligned properly. And it would have allowed me to control myself when I didn't have any control. When I would win, I'd want to go back in right away. When I lost, I'd want to go right back in. Like I, I was not fearful. Once I learned certain methods of getting in, you know, I was looking for it all the time, not understanding that the market's going to have an ebb and flow. There's a time delivery to all this shit. And unless you understand that, just the liquidity alone is not enough. It's essential, but it's not enough. You have to know how, how they use time. And that takes time to teach, which is why I tell everyone you know, a minimum is a year. And that's just really scratching the surface. Your best learning is going to be in your year two through four. But you can be profitable all through that. So don't let that be a deterrent. Don't let it be like, oh, I'm, you're saying I can't make money. No, you can fucking make money just watching the YouTube uh, playlist from 2022. If you have a general foundation of understanding what price action usually does, you're, if, if you're familiar with trading, and you go into that model, you can go right out the gate, boom, and start finding profitability. I'm convinced of that. But the problem is, is I have a lot of people that come to me that are greenhorns. They're brand new. They're just right out of the, the womb. <laughs> okay, Here, make me a trader. I, I don't know how to walk yet, but make me a trader. So it's, it's all like almost in, in an impossibility for some of you to learn from me because I'm, I'm not the beginning step. And, and that's... Like I've wrestled over the weekend. Like, do I even want to waste time with creating like a baby step ICT version? Like, okay, the basics of the basics. I just don't have the patience for that shit. Like, I don't, I don't have the patience for it. And, and throughout the years, I've thought about doing it. I thought about doing it. I just don't have it in me to do it. Like, I don't have it in me to do that. So I'm not the beginning step. Like, it's, it's actually better for you to try to get out there and mess up learn from doing something stupid, some other kind of approach, and then 
that way you have some experience to measure it against. So that way you can see, oh, yeah, I would have placed my stop loss there or I would have saw the market going lower or higher there. Like I was admitting to you when I was 20 some years old and I thought the Swiss franc was going to go up because I thought the weekly chart had a bullish um, bull flag. When all it was doing was setting up a model that I teach now today as a mega trade. And I couldn't I couldn't see it. My infancy as as a trader you know, hid it from me. I didn't have the understanding. I didn't didn't have the experience, but I saw a pattern. And because I was looking for longs only, you know, you're going to look what you're you're going to find what you're looking for if you look hard enough. You know, if you torture the data and the numbers enough, they'll they'll submit and admit to anything you want it to do. And that's the problem with this. That's why indicators look wonderful because, given enough time and sample set, and, and any indicator can be made to show profitability. But when you walk forward with it, does it really work? So I'm teaching you elements of time, price delivery, algorithmic price delivery, macros, things that generalize uh, delivery and price. When should they form? How do they form? What does it look like? Why should it take place? Who's getting hurt from, from that unfolding in price and who stands the gain? That's, that, these are questions that you need to ask yourself. If I was asked to like, present a... That's a good wheelie, man. This guy took off to the wheelie. The um, <laughs> the uh, that really was a good wheelie, by the way. The um, you have to ask yourself questions like a checklist. Okay, those are ty the type of questions. If if you miss it, just rewind it when it gets on YouTube from somebody else that puts it up uh, um, or listen to the recording here. The uh, the idea who who stands the game. Like you have to personify the market with this person, okay? It's not one person. It's a collective entity that I dub as smart money. They don't make courses. You don't know them. You don't know none of their names. They're way above George Soros, okay? And they're employed by folks that you aren't going to meet. And they're in there taking the other side that's that's a segment of the market that no one's talked about they hinted at something like if there was somebody out there could do this all the time this puppeteer composite man that exists but not in the scope that it's promoted if you can personify the market like that where this unforeseen entity like you never have an opportunity to meet them if they're cannibalizing market participants what you're looking at in price right now where would they be long and it's easy to study it real time because you can see where has it where's the price action move that's unfolding right now where did it originate recently did it take stops when it started there because if it didn't it's probably un, unfinished and probably needs to go lower if it has taken stops then look for inefficiencies or buy stops above the marketplace because that's where it's going to go. Any time frame. That's what I look at when I'm looking at price. I'm not looking at Fibonacci ratios and fucking patterns and like I'm not look that's that's the distraction. That's the misdirection. You're looking at the left hand when the right hand's doing the work. They'll paint these uh, these charts whether it be candlesticks or Heikinashi or whatever the fuck you're looking at, Renko bars, point and figure, you know, point at the chart and try to figure out what the fuck it means. All that stuff is distractions. They're all distractions. And if you can find a way to simply say, all right, sure, it sounds Tom Clancy. So it's, it's, it's conspiracy theory to listen to some of the shit I'm saying, but it works. It works because this is the market. And if you look at the performance of other students that are doing really, really well. What are they doing? They're going in with a model that they have simplified using the concepts that I've taught. You only need a reason to be bullish or bearish. I mean, let's just strip it down to the Chrome folks, okay? You're going into the marketplace. All right. What I want to be focusing on this week? Um, I want to be a bull or I want to be bear. So what constitutes some reason for you to feel confident about that go to the weekly chart is there a reason for it to expand higher what what would it need to go up to to go higher on the weekly chart 
if it's going to make a case to be going higher on the weekly chart, it stands the reason that you're probably going to get one good bullish day using the daily time frame. And if you do it around the time when there's a medium or high impact news driver that just happens to come out that day during that session, chances are you probably narrowed down your focus to a opportunity in the marketplace. That's not an everyday uh, occasion. And you need to warm up to the idea that I don't need to be in here every day. I can. Me, inner circle trader, ICT, I am the fucking man with this information. This is my shit. But I don't need to be out here every single day. And if I'm the creator of this stuff and I'm not here every day doing it, what makes you feel like you have to live up to that expectation? You've, you've presented this as a challenge to yourself when nobody offered it as a challenge. You did that. You're placing Olympic size challenges in front of you with next to no experience. And you're starting off on the wrong foot by doing that. Less is more. Being content with enough. If you're only making $1,000 a week, that's all you can amount to in the first year or two. Is that fucking failure to you? <laughs> I don't see that. I don't see it as failure. But if you start measuring yourself up to everybody else, well, this guy, he said he made $5,000. Or this guy, look, he's got a certificate that says he, you know, he, he got five accounts passed. Oh, this person's got to pay out for, for $20,000. This person's got $3,000 paid out you know, every single day this week. What are you doing? You're minding someone else's business. And if you're minding someone else's business, who is minding yours? No wonder you're getting the results you're looking for. No wonder you're stressing because you're not minding your own fucking business. This is your business. This is your workshop. This is your storefront. This is your incorporation. You incorporated. If you aren't worrying about you and what it is that you're doing or not doing and when to do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. I'm educating you and I can't do it for you. I can't push you into a trade. I can't put you out of a trade. You're doing all that. But you got to get real comfortable in your skin without me. Because warming up to the idea of, okay, ICT tells me to draw. Instead of just listening to where I think it's going to go, go into the charts and explain to yourself in your journal why I said those things. Because I'm giving you all those details. They're there on YouTube. They're in my Twitter spaces. They're in my tweets. I didn't hide it from you. And you have to condition yourself to see those things in old moves because it's not, it, it didn't just work on that one instance. My concepts didn't just start working, you know, because this, this, you know, it just unfolded just recently. We've been doing this for years, years and years and years. People watch me do this every single day behind a paywall. Every single day I'm expected to call it. No signal service or not, it still requires understanding and skill. And you're being exposed to it and you need to take advantage of it while I'm here. Because November, you're left with what, of whatever I've taught, that's it. And if you haven't done the work of testing yourself and conditioning yourself throughout this year, looking for what it is I'm teaching at that time and go back and look at old moves and see if those same things don't occur and exist. In the and it does. That's, that's the epiphany. That's the aha moment. Like, oh, wow, it really is there. These gaps really do exist. And I can go in there and I can trade them every single time when it pre presents the opportunity to do so. And I can do as little as five handles and do well. Yeah. So why are you putting all this expectation on yourself? These mountains of, of goals that nobody realistically could be meeting in the beginning stages of this because you don't even know who you are as a trader. You all have the capability to exceed way beyond your expectations, way, whatever you think is profitable. And this is where you succeed. Like what, what defines that? Can I ask you that and, 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 and reply to this post that this Twitter space has um, been launched from? You can reply to it. What, what is, what is success to you? When, when you get this amount of money, what would you call that as success? Like you, you have met your goal right now. When you first started trading, what was that? It may have changed, but what was it from the beginning? For, for those that are brand new, what is that goal? Some of you, it's, it's $100,000. Some of you, it's a million dollars. I can tell you a million dollars is not a lot of money. Like it's not a lot of money. I, I spent literally $3.7 million in the last 
11 months. It goes quick. It goes real quick. What used to be a million dollars is nothing now. A million dollars is like the new 50,000. Years ago, it was a lot of money, but it's nothing now. But whatever that is, don't, and don't let me discourage you. If it was a million dollars, say that's what your goal was. Say, okay, if I, if I made a million dollars, that's success. If it's a hundred thousand dollars, don't let me say whatever I said and diminish. Like, oh, I, I'm embarrassed to say that because this is a lot of money to me, but it wouldn't be a lot of money. I just, I want to know just for the sake of knowing the listeners' expectations of what they view as success. Like, what's the mile marker for you that says I, I've made money? Because I can tell you, there's people all around the world are going to have a, a way, you know, separation between what some may view as success and others not. And invariably, there's so many people there's going to say a hundred million dollars, you know, some crazy number. That's 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 a pipe dream. <laughs> I'm not saying you can't make it, but we're talking about when people come into trading, they're not expecting to make a hundred million dollars. I'm saying when you first got into this, what was your goal? What was the threshold that you said, if I could do this, that's that's success. If every woman's honest, you'd be able to see there's a lot of humble thresholds that if you understand what I'm teaching you, you can really get to those levels. But what happens when you get there? You're not going to be satisfied. Were you going to stop trading because you got that? Oh, I'm done. <laughs> I made my million dollars. So I need nothing to do. No. You're going to want to do more, especially if you're young. I'm old, okay? I'm not an old, old man, but I've, I've been doing this my entire adult life. Like, I'm, I'm counting down, like, I don't, how many more years do I have? I don't know, because tomorrow is not promised to no man. But I've not, I've not been a good steward with my time, with my family. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm going to unplug. Like, I'm not interested. Like, I've, I've done enough. I'm content with what I've done. I'm satisfied. I don't need to feel like I got to do something else in trading to feel like I've done something. I I've done that. And I need to feel good about being the husband I should be, the father that I should have been and haven't been because I've allowed these markets to be a vampire and suck my life force, my attention, my time, my efforts and energy. and not allow me to be what I'm more uh, the word escapes me. I should have been doing that more so than, than, than just this. Can I offer a better life for my family? Cause I've done all that. Yeah. But it came at a cost and I don't want any of you to repeat this. Like you can, you can allow these markets to be a wonderful an appendage to what it is that you do in, in your life. That's balance. I didn't balance it correctly. I learned balancing time later, mid 40s. I had no concern of the outcome of how my family would. Because I was thinking, well, they're going to be happy because I'm, I'm making a lot of money. I'm presenting, you know, a lifestyle for them. And you know, if they need something, dad's got it. You know, uh, that was my rationale for doing it. But that's not good. Because I wasn't there for the dad moments I should have been. And if you're a young person without children and you plan on having children. Or necessarily you don't have to be a young person. But if you haven't had children yet and you're about to do so and you're embarking on this journey. Do follow what I put out in that 1440 series. It, it's you will hear from my heart. And uh, the series I did, if I could go back and tell my younger self, you know what I know now, um, I literally expose my heart to all of you. And uh, I can be honest and tell you, I, I was afraid to put it on YouTube because it's, it's raw. And I speak right from my heart and I'm telling you things that pro most men probably wouldn't admit to because we want to walk around like we have a 12 inch cock and any woman can get with us because we want them. And, and that's just the way it is. And we're Mr. Everything, a Chad. And in reality, you know, when you have children, your life isn't yours. And I did not do the right things. I did not do the right things. I, I spent too much time pursuing this. 
and not being the dad. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but I have time, hopefully, that I can now pursue things and, and make memories with them. So you can have a whole lot of money. You could be, you know, a person of influence in the, in this industry and be a fucking failure as a family person. And I was a failure. I, I was not doing the things I should have been doing. I spent way too much time doing all this stuff, but it's, it's, it's my passion. And I, it's the, know, the words I'm, I'm, they're just not reaching far enough for me to, to feel satisfied and explaining. All I know is you can think that you're successful because you make a lot of money and you can have a lot of nice things and afford things and not worry about the cost of living and still not be happy, not satisfied and regretful. If you do the things that I did wrong, you'll have that same discomfort that I feel. Like I know some of you sit around thinking, man, I see he must be really happy right now. He's kicking back. I have a lot of regret. I wish I would have done things that were simple, that they didn't cost anything. Just my time and attention towards my kids and my wife. If I would have done those things more, I wouldn't feel the guilt that I feel. I have lots of money, but that doesn't compensate for it. Them knowing that we have that money doesn't compensate for it. You hear my kids tell me just this weekend. So this is awesome, Dad, to be able to you know, spend time with you like this because we never had it before. And I broke down right in the restaurant. I'm appreciative that they recognize it, but it's just like, and I don't want to tell them don't say that because they're, it, it, they should tell me. They're, in, they're It's entitled to them. They need to tell me that stuff and I need to hear it. But you don't want to be like I am right now hearing it where you could just plan your life better. Success can be had and you don't need to be a, a a monster in it like I was trying to be. Like it, it devoured my entire life. And for the folks that are constantly always you know, reaching out to me and trying to tell me, please don't you know, stop doing what you're doing in November, you need to really understand why I need to stop. Like if you respect me, you'll respect the fact of why I'm doing it. Because the money, I can make lots of money. I can make mentorships. I can make books. I can make courses. I can blow that fucking YouTube channel up and advertise every fucking where and be a, the biggest name in this industry. I don't want it. I don't want it. It didn't do anything for me as a family man. At the end of the day, I have to look my children in the face. I have to look at my wife. And yes, they might smile and say, I love you, dad. But behind that, they have so many open voids of time where I was not there and I was in the house with them. Do you want to hear that from your children? Do you want to look at your wife when she says, I love you. And you know, she's reaching to just to say, you are the man I love. You're the person I married. You're the father of our children. And I'm appreciating the time with you right now, but I have to appreciate it so much more. Cause I don't know if you're going to go right back into doing what you've been doing for all these years in your entire adult life. You don't want to feel that. Trust me when I tell you, you don't want to feel that. Fast cars, big bank accounts doesn't compensate for it. And a lot of people you know, that write books, they won't ever tell you that shit because they didn't get rich. They're making money off of book sales. They're selling books because they have to sell that book. I'm walking away from it at the biggest point of my career as a mentor, as a teacher or whatever. All the hype and stuff that's around me right now, I'm uncomfortable by it. Like I'm, I'm genuinely uncomfortable. I have a lot of people asking me to talk publicly. I'm not going to drop names, but uh, I'm just, I'm shy. Like I, I don't want to be like that. I can talk like this and pour my heart out to you because you're not sitting next to me. If you were being trained one by one, one you know, on one, I wouldn't talk about the things I talked about. I would talk about the markets and how they would beat the fuck out of you. But I'm not going to tell you where I messed up as a husband, as a, as a dad, as as the real human being. I failed there miserably. I would want to know that from a mentor. I would want to know 
where they made major mistakes. And every book and author and every educator out there, they've never really scratched that surface. They talk about things outwardly. This person over here as a case study. But strangely, they don't ever have any problems in their own fucking life. Like they don't have any errors that they made. And I have. And I wish I wouldn't have done it. And since I went through pain, the Bible says, you know, we go through these trials and tribulations and things that hurt us. So that way we can give a testimony. I didn't lose sight and hope of, you know, who was in control of me when I didn't have control of myself. And ultimately, he he steered me where I am today. Even though I thought I was dialed in, I was lost. I had no idea where I was going. I had no idea I was going to end up where I'm at right now. I didn't set out to be inner circle trader. You know, Mr. Smart Money Concepts and all this bullshit that people build up around my name. Like I literally did a, a, a search on YouTube. Do it. Just do an inner circle trader or ICT on YouTube. And it's weird to see all these people with my logo and like putting all that stuff. Like it's, it's not like what I thought it was going to be like when I was 20 years old, if I could be really good at this and I could be popular, I wanted to be Larry Williams 2.0, but better. And I'm going to be all over the place. I'm going to teach and do, circuit teachings and go to Australia and go to UK and all that shit. And I, I'm not, I'm not into that. Like, I don't want to do it. Like just a little bit of notoriety, which, you know, it's, I'm, I'm still small. I, I just can't imagine being some behemoth with all this attention on me. I wouldn't do well with it. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me feel, makes me feel anxious. Not that I'm afraid of anything. I just, I'm uncomfortable. Like, I'm uncomfortable when, when people walk up. We had a guy, we were out uh, in the 2021 vet. And we were up on Bel Air Road. We were going down towards the, the Beltway. And this guy gets out of his car and he starts taking pictures of us. I'm like, what the fuck? Again, man. And he's like, beautiful car, beautiful car. Can I get another picture from the other side? I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do to stop you? But it's just like, it's weird. Now, I'm certain that that person has no idea that I'm an inner circle trader. But I was weirded out by the whole experience. Like, I, I, you know, some of you young guys be like, yeah, I would love that. That would be fucking amazing. I don't like that. Like, it, I love the car for me. I don't give a fuck if anybody else likes it or doesn't like it. I like it. I bought it because I want it. And I don't use my image as ICT publicly. Like, I don't do that. Like, I don't have inner circle trader tags like on my car like you'd probably expect ict1 ict2 you know for for every car i have i don't i don't have that i don't want to draw any kind of attention to myself for that shit and i'm really looking forward to post november just being back to just boring me like i i, I miss that about me like i want to have just my own personal space my own time and and back to just being content like that and I said the other day on Twitter, I said, when I wake up in the morning, all of you, my personal students and all of you are my first thought. Now, I have five kids and I'm married. Is that normal? No. There's something wrong there. It's imbalanced. I have to balance that. And as long as I keep making myself available like this, it will remain unbalanced. This will always take more of my time. Well, I mean, we're going on three hours and it's not monetized. I live this and I want you to succeed. But I also have a family and they want me in their life. They want me making memories with them. And I have to make myself available for that. And that's that's the reason why in November I'm stopping. I want my holiday season to be joyful away from markets, away from Twitter, away from YouTube, you know, all that stuff. And it's not because I don't love doing this. I absolutely love it. I love it. But I have to take myself away from it because I can't control myself to not keep doing it. It's, just, it's, it's who I am. And I need to change that. I don't want to stay inner circle trader. I don't want to be ICT you know, the rest of my life.
I mean, obviously I am, but I don't want to be living my life as inner circle trader. I just want to be, you know, me. And I hope you can appreciate that. And it may not seem fun, like, oh man, it sucks. But all my videos are staying up. Now, I mean, once in a while, a couple times a month, I'm not promising it. To talk about a market, you know, share an opinion about something. But I'm not promising that. And I want you to understand that, that that's where I want to go. And if I do do that, that still in itself will reduce. I don't need YouTube. I don't need ad revenue. I don't need mentorships. And I don't need book sales. But I do want to make my final point about all this. And be done with it. And whatever you guys do collectively as a community, as, as the industry, whatever you do with the information that helps you improve, you know, God bless you in it. Like, that's the whole reason why I did it. That's why I did it. And if it was anything other than that, I'd still be pushing and trying to build up all the things right now to, to make it bigger. I don't want it to be bigger. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. So you might be surprised if you find success and you find notoriety, you know, it might be the same for you or other people that thrive in that. You, you want to be a celebrity and you become one and you excel in it. I, I just don't feel comfortable with it. Like I, I just, I'm just a regular person you know, with a blessing. And I asked in a prayer that if he would let me understand it, put it in front of me where I can understand it. I would spend the rest of my life teaching it. And once I've said everything I will say publicly, there's nothing less, there's nothing left for me to teach. Like I've emptied myself out. And anything that's kept is not for you. And I don't feel obligated. I don't, that wasn't part of the arrangement because I taught how to trade. I taught how to read the markets the way I see it. And I understand how it's delivered. And I'll be content. And that's my goal. I, that I have an itinerary, like I said, uh, uh, what I want to talk about, when I want to talk about it, how I want to talk about it. And when we're done, we're done. And being upset about it, it's just a waste of energy and, and, and time. Pour yourself into the content. Study it. Make it yours. And then don't forget me. Shoot me an email at innercircletrader at gmail.com and I will love to see your testimony. I would love to see what you're doing. I get so many of them every single week. There's so many people all around the world that reach out to me and, and say, this is what I've been able to do. This is what I'm doing with it. You know, paying for communities in impoverished nations to, to be fed, you know, putting wells in places where they don't have drinking water. You know, that's the stuff I'm talking about. Not, I bought this Lamborghini. I bought this McLaren. You know, I bought this house here. I live in a, a new place of the world because of you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. God bless you for that. But I'm, I want to know what you do with it to help other people. That's what I want. I want to see you doing that. Contributing to people that don't have it. Not repackage my stuff and make mentorships. Okay, that, that's the other thing. I don't, I don't want that. A guy emailed me and said, hey, can I have your permission to... Uh, Take your mentorship and turn it into a book. I, I promise I'm going to do word for words. That way I have it right. That's plagiarism. <laughs> okay. Several people already did that on Amazon and I already reached out to Amazon. But, you know, anyway. Make sure I covered everything I want to talk about. Yeah, so you want, you want to strip everything down that I've taught and make a simple model out of it. You need something to justify why you're bullish or bears. You derive that from the weekly chart. And then you look on the daily chart for liquidity or inefficiencies. Where is it going to reach for within that weekly chart expansion, either higher or lower? If you can find something that can agree on what your expectations are on the weekly chart, what does that mean? If you're bullish, it means you think that the weekly chart, the candlestick that's forming for this week to come or the present week that hasn't completed yet, it's going to reach up to some kind of inefficiency, like a fair value gap above the marketplace on the weekly chart now, or it's going to go above a weekly high where buy stops would be. Which one is more likely to occur to go up for either one of those scenarios or to go down for either one of those scenarios, but in 
the reverse. In other words, looking for an old low if you're bearish or an, a fair value gap below market price on the on the candlestick that's on the weekly chart. It sounds like an oversimplification because you're you're ignorant to what it is you're looking for because you're you're too new. But for people that have been studying price action, it's easy to discern which is more likely. Is it likely to go up for either one of those two reasons or go down for either one of those two reasons? And whichever one is more likely to go with, that's your bias going in from a macro perspective. That is not your daily bias. Your daily bias has to be derived from your daily chart. So, for instance, if we had a really big move lower right on Monday and we're expecting it to expand up the upside, then we're expecting what on Tuesday or Wednesday? We want to see kind of something to, to reverse and go higher, but not change our bias because of it. Everybody looking at one, st one candlestick on a daily chart would follow that logic that, okay, that big move on the one candlestick on a Monday that's going to be the beginning of the, the move for the rest of the week. And that's generally not what happens, especially when the instances that we're expecting a, a specific thing in the weekly chart to either occur expanding higher or lower. So the weekly chart gives us our macro perspective, the higher time frame perspective. Then we use our daily chart to zero in with the economic calendar, a medium or high impact news driver. In that time of day, that's when the manipulation starts. And after that initial manipulation, we wait for a imbalance to form. There's going to be some displacement. The fair value gap will form. What time will it form? 10 to 11 or 2 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If it's in London, there you go. You're three times. There's three times in a day. Every single day, one of them forms it in every market. Every market, one of those time frames or kill zones, if you want to call it, it will form. That fucking drone has been sitting here in front of me. I'm going to take a picture of it. I got to do it. Hopefully, the audience can still hear me. I closed the Twitter app, so if it, if it closes on me, I apologize. You can probably hear me now if that happened. This son of a bitch right there. All right, I got a few pictures of it. So, this from the time I noticed it, it's been, it's been sitting here the whole time. Ain't moving around, ain't doing anything, just hanging out. So, Anyway, it kind of distracted me from what I was saying. But uh, the weekly chart we use for our bias or macro perspective, are we bullish or bearish? And we use our daily chart in conjunction with the economic calendar. So if there's an economic calendar that has, um, for instance, a Tuesday or Wednesday, it has a medium or high impact news driver, then we know that there's going to be manipulation on that specific day and at, around that time. We go in with the narrative in mind that they're going to use that initial manipulation to trick people with the wrong direction. So it's like a Judas swing. Okay. If you want to strip it down to the bare chrome, one easy model that I'm just giving to you just like this. This is not the only way to do it. Everyone needs a muffler. The lower time frames, four hour, one hour. Okay. You're just basically looking at market structure then. You're looking for uh, specific key levels to measure to see swing projections to get low-hanging fruit objectives. And when you time the market, when we're using like the silver bullet as, a, as a, a model of choice, it could be as easy as the optimal trade entry. It could be as easy as using the um, 2022 model. Any one of those can form in these silver bullet time windows, these 60-minute intervals. Where your your focus is literally reduced down to one single hour. Now, if you know that there's going to be a medium or high impact news driver, you know those days are going to be really easy for a silver bullet to form. What time does a silver bullet form on? You start looking at it from a five minute chart. You look from a five minute. If it's not there, you go down to a four minute chart. If it's not there, you go down to a three, then down to a two, down to a one. If it doesn't exist on a one minute chart, you have to. Either let it go if you don't want to go into the seconds chart or go into the 30-second or 15-second chart. 
don't go any lower than 15 seconds. But that's how that's where it's going to form. It's a it's a high frequency trading entry mechanism if you're using on the seconds chart. But you're using a criteria that's been formed from a weekly to a daily, specifically aiming on a day that has a medium or high impact news driver, and you're waiting for that initial uh, displacement and manipulation. And you only trade between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. The entry must be taken there. If it isn't, you wait to the next session. You missed the move or it's going to be in the afternoon session or it already formed in the London session. There's your rules. It's simple, but you won't stick to it if you're in, if you're undisciplined. If you're undisciplined, you're going to like, oh, you know, I can't do that. I can't follow that. But if you found it, it's going to give you money. It's, it's, it, you're going to take losses when it comes, but it makes money. It gives you consistency in terms of finding setups. It's a logic that you can time it. The economic calendar, you can see in advance. What's the economic calendar going to be for next month in June? They're already there. They're already tell you when these reports are going to come out. So you know, okay, there's going to be an opportunity on that day. A Mustang. <laughs> I blow the doors off you, boy. But the idea of not knowing where these setups form, that's all it's all been canceled. I'll tell you exactly now where, when, and why. The logic going. Now, what about all the other moves that take place around the other days and intraday that's opposed to that weekly objective or where we think it's going to go to? You ignore it, you filter it out. That's what I was really getting to on Friday. Every long was pretty much good. There were some longs that I should have taken more partials off or closed the trade on and then not gone short. But I was showing you both both directions, up, down, up, down. The longs were better. Why? Because the weekly volume imbalance was the real draw on liquidity. Now, if you want to be real nimble and you get your five handles when it made itself available to you, like I could have done that up, down, up, down, up, down all day long on Thursday. but your focus is to look for quality over quantity. Your goal should not be, I can take 12 trades intraday in the same day and all of them be profitable. That, that's not something you should strive for. You want to be able to be consistently profitable and content with looking for the best, the choicest, the cream of the crop, best setups. So that way you can trust it. And when you're able to do that, number one, you're exhibiting discipline. You're exhibiting self-control that most traders don't have. They don't have that. The way you arrive at it is having a model that's well-defined. What are you looking for? What does it look like? When does it occur consistently? See, if the markets were random, and I'm going to say this and close it. If the markets were indeed random, how the fuck is a silver bullet set up possible? And why is it so consistent? Because the markets are not random. They're controlled, they're coded, and they're ran by an algorithm. And because it's coded and it's ran by an algorithm, it has to do certain things. And we are waiting for the time when manipulation would occur, whether it be automated within the part that is algorithmic or if it's manual intervention. We're waiting for that displacement. And we'll fall victim to trades that are manually intervened. Sometimes there'll, there'll be a, a trade that sets up. You'll get in it. You're following all the rules. And then all of a sudden, oh, hang on one second, I had to turn the car back on. There you go. You'll, you'll take a trade and it'll be stopped out. But nothing has changed. All it was was a run on the liquidity. One more time, your stop was in too early. You entered too early. And then you got to re-enter re the market. How do you know that? Experience. Studying old moves. Not seeing the other side of the marketplace just because you got stopped out. If I, if I get stopped out and I'm like, okay, I got stopped out. Did it really change anything? No. It just ran for my stop. No problem. I'm going back in. Okay. That's, that's what happens. Sometimes you're going to do it wrong as a human being. But you have to have the experience to be able to identify the market still has the opportunity to do what is I expected in the beginning, even though I took a loss. There's going to be times where you see the market change and morph into 
if you're bullish, something extremely bullish. You watched me do that on Friday too. Market went down. I was already long several several contracts. And it went one more time down into a level that I felt that was returning just for a reclaimed PD array. And I went and I knew it was that was the one. That was the one I was waiting for. There's no doubt about it. And added another larger position in terms of the trade size. And it turned right there and ran away. That's experience. You can't get that from a book, even if I wrote it. You can't get that from a video, whether I do a five-minute video of it or someone else tries to reduce it down to a five-minute video, or if I do a whole week-long lecture on it. It needs to be experienced individually. And that's the part that nobody wants to hear. Nobody wants to hear that. They, they think that there's going to be a teacher out there that's going to be able to tell them real short and easy, this is what you need to know, and now you heard me say it. Or I showed it to you as an, as an example. Now you know how to do it. That's, that, that's bullshit. Believe me, that's bullshit. The folks that use my name on their YouTube channels and they say, I've done all the work so that way you don't have to. Or learn this easier and faster. ICT did this, 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 and I can make it faster for you. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. Because you can't compress what needs to be learned on an individual basis. You can't. That That is a bandwidth that's uniquely experienced. You can't do anything to change it. You can't augment it. You can't speed it up. You can't elongate it. It is what it is. And that's what makes this expensive as an industry. Not because you can lose money, but because it takes a lot of fucking effort and time. And you bring all your baggage to it. All your, your character flaws. The things that you don't like about yourself. And if you're really forced to look at it, it make you unsettled. And some people don't like who they discover who they are and they manifest that in losing because they don't want to they don't want to weather going through it to grow through that. They don't want to they just want to turn their cheek and say, oh, this guy's a fraud. This stuff doesn't work. Nobody makes money trading. And there it is. And that allows them to live the, the existence where they haven't corrected their problems, their impatience, their impulsiveness, their greed, their lazy fuckingness. Like I just coined a term, lazy fucking this. <laughs> Whatever. Lazy doesn't work here, folks. Lazy doesn't work, and impatience doesn't allow you to stay in this game long enough to learn. So you have to be patient. You have to be really, really disciplined with your time. If you're listening to someone, like for instance, if someone new, <clears throat> someone new that comes to this industry, maybe this is the first time you listen to me. And I probably talked about things that mean nothing, mean nothing to you. And you probably are going to close this in a couple minutes when I end it, if you're even going to stay that long. You probably already turned off anyway, just to be honest with you. So, but the, um, the folks that see or, or listen to things like this and come away with this expectation or, or opinion that this was a waste of time. You haven't traded with real money. You haven't found consistency yet. Because you believe that there's something out there someone has that's going to be easy, one, two, three. You're going to understand it real quick. You're never going to make mistakes. You don't have to fix any character flaws in yourself. And you're going to make money and you'll never have a losing trade. Believe me, I felt that same shit existed too when I first started. You may not admit it publicly on social media, but that's deep down inside. That's what you're really looking for because you really believe that it's out there. And I'm probably the closest thing to it. And if I, fend, if I had this, there's got to be somebody else out there that has this much better. And shortened it up, make it real easy for you. And I'm being honest with you. The things I'm telling you that I can't teach you, no one's going to be able to teach you. You learn it from experience. You lose, you learn from that. How can I teach you adequately how to fix a $25,000 drawdown with real money? How can, how, can I, how can I tell you in a book, in a video, in a video series, how can I, even if I did it live, I went into a live account, purposely lost $25,000 and said, now here's how I'm going to fix it. You don't, you can't, you can't bring yourself to the same perspective as if it was your two, if it was your $25,000, you can't, you have to experience that. So there, there's a whole lot of learning curve to this, that everybody simply just tap toes, tiptoes around it and tap dances. Like it's all going to be good. It's not. And you have to learn the, the most valuable lessons are from the pain. The losing. I love 
when I hear people, whether it be using my content, even, even folks that are outside of what I teach, when they're candid with their audience and they say, you know, I'm really having a hard time with this, 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 and I lost this, and this is what I did wrong. Man, I have the utmost fucking respect for somebody like that because that's the reality. Everybody can go out there with hindsight fucking Harry mentorship level shit and talk about what's already happened. And it sounds educated. It sounds like, oh, wow, he should be able or she should be able to do that live. But they'll never do it. They'll never fucking do that. They won't call it. They won't trade it. They won't even record their executions. And they're building their name on fucking horse shit just for clout. The folks that are out there that are really out there in the trenches and they're sharing whether they're teaching or just making their experience known to everyone else on YouTube. That's what I like about Corbs. Okay. And Corbs, if you're listening, dude, seriously, your fucking channel would grow if you recorded your executions and then went in with the same idea that you do afterwards. Like when you go and you meet everybody at noon, you're probably already talking live right now. If you're in his live stream, if he's doing one right now, tell him I'm, I'm mentioning him right now. <laughs> but I told him once before, I said, just record your executions. I mean, you're, you're going so far as to show what your executions were up and down, you know, getting in after the fact. So just, re just record them, just record them. And then afterwards, whether it's good or bad, go in and tell everybody what you're, what you're feeling and what you felt at the time. That is, that's valuable. I would love to fucking see it because you're being honest when you say you're not doing something right or you're struggling. That to me is refreshing. That's refreshing because take a, just take a look at what is promoted in this industry, whether it's Forex or futures or trading crypto, whatever the fuck it is. Everybody believes that it's the fucking rich lifestyle. That's all they got to show. They don't show anything else. If I lose, I'm going to show you I fucking lose. If I get it wrong, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and tap dance around it. I'm like, okay, I did that wrong. Boom, 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 boom. This is what I'm doing now. How often am I doing it incorrectly? I'm telling you what's going to happen, and it does. But you saw on Friday, I took a $975 hit. Didn't do shit to me. Bringing the element of humanity into it will grow your channel. Drama is not going to sell your shit. You just look like a, a little weak person with little dick complex. Okay? Trolling is stupid. Everybody out there can be trolled. I can be trolled. Everybody can be trolled. This community, this industry would be better if every person out there, and this is a challenge to everybody that has a YouTube channel. Okay. Um, I like that guy, Kimmel. Yeah, I'm subscribed to him. I like listening to him. Um, I like Hannah. And there's a couple other people I watch. I'm not subscribed to, but uh, I, I'm I'm a little leery to talk about other people because you know Patrick Whelan pulled a dick move. Okay, I, I, all I did was give him good good shit and, and pump him up, and he want to act like an asshole. So, but his channel will not grow with that kind of stuff. It won't it won't grow. He's still you know sitting underneath two hundred thousand. It might grow a little bit over time, but he would have exponential growth if he wasn't so fucking toxic. Be real and don't try to tear other people down. Now, I can tear down other approaches to trading because it's all shit. And I can tell you why it's shit. I can show you where its weaknesses are and where I use my content to smash the shit out of anybody that uses that logic. That's not me going after any one particular YouTube operator. But the people that use that methodology will take offense to that and say, well, he's talking about me. No, I'm not. If I'm going to talk about you, I'm going to drop your fucking name like I just did. Stop talking about me for clout. Just stop talking about me. Just focus on you. But be real. Patrick's strengths are when he's real and when he puts down his ego and he says what he's doing wrong. That is growth. He'll learn from his own shit and he'll also tell his audience that this is normal. Everybody experiences it. I went through it. I went through it. I physically had to take myself away from the charts because I know the tendency for me. 
I like to think I'm better than my algorithm. And if I'm given an opportunity or a stage to do so, why the fuck should I get here and do something? I know deep down inside, I'm not going to be in my best performance. I'm not. So I took myself away from it. And then I took myself in front of the charts when it was presented itself. And then boom, like gangbusters, exactly how we saw our charts. Your chart looks like mine. I, I predicted the future using what I teach you. We didn't react to shit. We don't react to anything. We predict the future. We predict where price is going to go. We wait for certain things to occur. We go in and attack it like that cheetah an algorithm. Uh, that an algorithm. <laughs> an algorithm. I just coined another term. An, an analogy. Okay. So when we're looking at price, we're anticipating certain performance in price and then go after it. We're not, you know, if it does this, I'm going to react to it by doing that. No, I know. My students know it's going to do this. When it does, my limit order is waiting for it. I'm waiting for it, it to do what I already know it's likely to do. And when it does, I'm all over that shit. And I'm going to milk it and look for low-hanging fruit objectives. Easy targets. Well, which high do I get out at? Okay, well, don't argue, don't argue with that. Where's five handles? Get out there. Do that for a couple months. Get accustomed to that. Build up some mental capital. What does it feel like to be right? Following this logic, what does it feel like? Because you don't know what that feels like. That's why you're uncertain. That's why you're afraid to put any time into it because you're afraid that too many people are learning ICT. It's going to stop work and they're going to change the markets. What the fuck? You're arguing that there is no algorithm, but then you're saying the same people are saying, but if all these people start doing it, the, the market's going to start going against it. What the fuck? You just admitted that there's an algorithm. <laughs> so come on. I mean, these people are, are stupid. They're fucking stupid. They're wasting all this time worrying about shit that isn't going to happen. What if thinking? What if if you put your ass down in front of the charts and studied like I told you? What if you did all that and it worked out and you made fucking money? What if it changed your whole fucking family tree and you don't live in lack anymore? What if you can make your ends fucking meet if you just listened? Think about that. You're bringing your bullshit, your myopic perspective into this. That's a problem. That is a fucking problem. You need to change it. You need to recalibrate. You're bringing negativity in something that you're intrigued enough to say, well, let me take a look at this guy's video or anybody else's shit. But you're too critical over it and yourself. You already, you've already defeated yourself. Before you even started, you have defeated yourself. You convinced yourself that there's no point in trying. It's a losing cause. So why bother? So why the fuck are you on social media posting that kind of shit? Because you're negative. There's something wrong in you. There's a disconnection. You need to identify what that is. There's a triggering that's going on. It's not ICT that does it. A lot of people would like to say, oh, I hate that fucking guy. Fuck you. I don't care if you like me or not. The point is, this is, this is the truth. It's the facts. I brought in my own baggage. I needed to feel significant because my own fucking parents didn't want me. That, you can't get any bigger than that. And I had a wife that left me. Hello? What do you got? What the fuck's your hold up? What's your problem? Where's your baggage? Like, there's the two biggest fucking things. The people that birthed me and the fucking woman I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with. Both of them walked out. What the fuck do you have that's worse than that? It's just mental baggage. Leave it at the fucking door. Come on in. Warm up. We brought cookies. We got refreshments. Hang out for a little while because you're going to leave a different person. You're going to know, I ain't got to be like that person. And leave the fucking baggage. We'll get rid of it on our own. We'll toss it out. We'll, we'll throw it in the bin for you. But leave that shit. Don't come into this learning experience with all this negativity bullshit. And what if thinking? And what if it does this? And what if it does that? What happens if you just follow the rules? And you do what other people around the fucking world that are doing independent of me. I'm not telling them what they're trading. They're doing it on their own, making fortunes. Fortunes. Have you made a hundred fucking thousand dollars last year? How about this year? You gonna make a hundred thousand dollars? I got people making that in the same fucking month, in the same week. What are you complaining about? It didn't cost you anything to pull up a fucking video. It takes time. Yes, I told you that. I didn't hide that from you. 
but you're you're missing this opportunity for you to change everything not just your ability to make and pay for shit but your whole life changes freedom fucking freedom you don't have to listen to your fucking boss you don't have to ask when your fucking vacations allowed to be had you do what the fuck you want to do and some of you are coming in here with a a Carl mindset. You got to trade every day because that's what fucking a good Carl will do. Fuck Carl. Fuck him. Fuck his mentality. Fuck his approach to life. We don't need the brown nose to market to keep it in love with us. We, we, we know when we can have our one night stands with this and it's nothing wrong with it. We can still be married and nobody's divorcing us. Trust me, your fucking wife's going to love you for having a one night stand with the fucking yes. Okay, you're getting in there. No STDs. The only STDs we got is a standard deviation. Don't ask me where the fuck that came from. It just came off the hip. But anyway, <laughs> I got my second win. You ready for another three hours? I'm just kidding. I'm out of water and uh, I haven't eaten today yet. So I got to go get something to eat. Hang out with my, my little guy. So I don't know, I'm not sure if you got anything from this one or not. I didn't really stick to my itinerary because I allowed the rabbit trails to dictate my pace and direction. But everything I said, I meant it. And it's all meant in, in the light of you improving. If you have a mentor, if you have somebody on, on YouTube that you'd like to watch, encourage them respectfully. Not Don't go there and troll. Don't go out there and say shit like, you know, you, we've never seen a payout from you. Before this one, you know, that kind of shit. That's it's, it's ignorant. I observed the same thing. I'm not going to beat this person up. But encourage them. Encourage them to be more open with what they find difficult. And you're going to find that if you're that type of person that you're out there trying to share what you do or trying to teach and you're open and you're honest with what you have found difficult in your trading. And this is back to my challenge. This is for everybody that has a YouTube channel that's listening to me. I would love, and I will literally look at all your videos. If you tweet it to me, I'll watch your video, okay, if you're doing this. I want you to be honest and talk about what you have struggled with in your trading. Like, what, what was the biggest boulder? What was the barrier, the roadblock in your understanding that you may still be un, you know, un, underneath of in terms of feeling the pressure from? Or what you overcome. Preferably, I'd, I'd love to hear the ones that have overcome it and what they did to, to do that. Because you're going to see everybody's dealing with unique shit. And what was the reasons for them to feel this problem? And if they're honest, and I, I don't expect, honestly, the level of honesty that I would like to see. But I'm encouraging you all. Like, I, I open myself up. When I do these and I've done certain YouTube video series where, I mean, you heard me cry. I, I'm a fucking man and I'm a human being. I have a heart. And when I think about the things I've done and I caused my family to miss me when I was right in the same room with them, in the same house. And like a ghost, I would pass by them and get right back to my charts. I, I caused that pain. I did that. And I, I regret it. I can't fix it. So the only thing I can do is spend more time with them. It might be for you, fear. Fear of losing. And what did you do to overcome that? It might be fear of getting into a trade. Fear of not getting out at the right price. Wh whatever. I'm, I'm just giving you suggestions. I'm not saying, let me use that and make a video. I mean, be honest. Because people are going to be able to tell if this is genuine or not. If you got the balls to do it, and get there and be honest and say, this is what I have dealt with. For this much time, or still encountering, and even though I can make money, this is what I, I keep coming up against. I keep coming up against that. I promise you, your fucking community will love you for that. They will love you for it because you're not trying to be superstar, rock star, celebrity trader that knows everything. I don't do that, and I'm it. I am that, and I don't present myself like that. I'm real. When I fuck up things, I will tell you, I fucked that up. I didn't do that right. This is what I had to learn from that. That's real mentoring. That's somebody that went through some real shit, learned from it, and this is how to avoid it. 
and why you shouldn't do these types of things. Because you're not going to be the exception. You're not going to be the person that you can walk around and say, well, that didn't happen to me. And so many young guys do the same shit that I say not to do and say, yeah, I'm just like ICT. Blah, blah, blah. Like it's a fucking brotherhood. I don't, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't want you to do that. <laughs> I don't want you to fucking have that pain. I don't, it, it, it's scar tissue. It's going to limit you. If you do the things I tell you to do and avoid the things I tell you to avoid, you can be better than I am. Even just trading one model that I created, you can be better than I am. How is that even possible? Well, number one, I'm never satisfied with my exits. I'm never, ever, ever satisfied with my exits. Never. I'm never fucking satisfied with them. I don't care how much money I can make in them. I'm never satisfied with them. My entries, unless I say otherwise, I'm pretty much getting in where I want to get in. But my weakness is my exits. I, I'm not content. I want more precision on my exits. And you probably look at what I'm doing and thinking, what the fuck, dude? If I could have just 25% of that, I'm great. But I'm not. So I, that's where I'm telling you, I, I have I have an issue with that. I, I wrestle with that every day. And when the markets are not trading and I'm contemplating what I can do to change things or what ideas I want to pursue and what I want to tweak. And it's always on the exit strategies. That's it. Because entries, I have I have that in lock. It's, it's a given. I have no fucking fear of getting into anything. And like I said, I got 81 different ways <laughs> to get into something. I'm getting in that bitch. Trust me. It's a vault. I'm getting in it. I'm taking something out of there. It may not be the all of it. But I'm going to take something out of it. But uh, I'm encouraging all of you that are YouTubers to do a video sometime this week. It doesn't have to be to today. It's not a race to get the first one out either. But uh, put some time into it and, and really consider a level of honesty that was required and and give the audience what they don't know about you tell them what what struggles you have what what causes you apprehension with taking a trade what what do you feel when you're in the trade what, what type of things do you wrestle with you know, what, what, are you, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And your audience is going to be able to draw a connection with you that you haven't made with them yet. See, the folks that hate me, that, that can't stand me because I literally have been teaching with a demo and I'm blowing up with a demo. I've shown live trading. I made twenty some $25,000 in one month, flipping a quarter, okay? Flipping a fucking quarter and doing a few things for Students in my private mentorship to ask me questions about, could you do this? How do I fix this? And how did I did that? And I made $25,000. None of that shit. Go through all those trade executions and you won't see any of the models I've, te I've taught. That you, it's not there. That's just managing money. And if you know how to make money, you can fucking flip a coin and make money. That's the proof. If I was in a fucking courtroom, I'd say, here's what I did this day. I flipped here. It was heads that day. Bye. It was this. Tails, it's sell. And I had to force myself to do that. That's it. That's all I was doing there. What do you think is going to happen when you apply sound money management? Sound money management. Good risk reward. And you're choosing your setup based on the logic I'm teaching. Your results are almost fucking guaranteed. The closest thing you can get to a guarantee of finding success over a large sample set, not every individual trade is going to be a win, but over a large sample set, you can reasonably expect a positive outcome. Now, a person that has mental baggage coming in can't expect that because they're going to do everything, whether they realize it or not, subconsciously, invertly or directly, to derail themselves. You're angry at your wife. You're angry at your husband. You don't feel like you're getting enough attention from them. You're going to act out. They said something to you to piss you off at work. You didn't get recognized at work. You got fired. Somebody did something to your child at school. You want to go up there and fucking make the news. All that kind of stuff. That That's real world shit. And if you're in a market, if you're in a trade, or if you go into a trade to kind of compensate for that, to give you a, a, a different vibe, to feel better about what the situation you're in. Because if I can make 500 bucks, hey, man, that's better than wanting to go up there and kill this motherfucker that had his kid come here and hit my kid or do something inappropriate. Whatever it is, whatever it is that real world brought to you that causes you discomfort or just boredom. If you have allowed boredom to come in and, and invite you into taking a trade, I ain't got nothing else to do. I don't really see anything in the market right now. The pattern I'm looking for, let me just go in here and buy it and see what happens. <laughs> and you fuck around and you find out. 
do you fall into that impulsiveness all the time? Do you do it frequently? You know, those types of things. As silly as they may sound, you know, some of you are probably not. You're like, I, I, I do that shit. What the hell? That is what it's like to be human. When you're human, these intrusive thoughts, they come in. And if you allow these intrusive thoughts to dictate the direction or execution where there's money behind it at risk, are you really trading? Or are you doing a science experiment? Mm -hmm. It's like taking uh, chlorine and mixing it with brake fluid. Now, the average person, well, what the fuck's that going to do? You don't want to do that. It will catch fire. Those two ingredients coming together, they're incendiary. You don't want to do that. And, but that's what you're doing. You're thinking, okay, I got something good and clean. Okay, I got something good and clean. I'm going to try to make something of myself in trading. That's the chlorine. That's the element we're talking about here. Okay, you're doing the right thing, trying to improve your life, but you bring in any brake brake fluid. You're you're stopping yourself. You're stopping yourself from doing something that the rules say you shouldn't do, or you should do, and that brake fluid being introduced to the chlorine, the good aspect of you trying to make a good thing in your life, clean up your act. It actually catches on fire. Violently on fire. On fire. And I know some of you are out there going to like, I'm going to go and do that. I got a pool. I'm going to get some chlorine, get some break. Make sure you, if you hurt yourself or burn your fucking shit down, don't, don't blame me. Okay. But that's the average person doesn't do that. And ignorance doesn't exonerate you from the damages that it would, you would cause by fucking around and finding out. So when you're doing these things and you're allowing intrusive thoughts in your personal life that's causing you pain, discomfort, boredom, rage, anger, insignificance, not getting the attention from your significant other, well, if I'm not getting it from him, if I'm not getting it from her, I'm going to go out there and make me some money because it'll remind me that I don't need them. I can go do my own shit and find someone else I better, better life can be had with, which leads to a whole new discussion that we won't have here now. But all those things human beings have a tendency to do. And I've been open with what I've done in the past where I hurt myself. I've caused monetary loss and scar tissue and mental baggage that I still wrestle with today. There are certain times when I get in the marketplace, I remind myself of, not because I want to remember it, but it just reminds me because I've done so many different trades that, that this is the time, uh, there's a time I did this type of trade before and I didn't know this and that. And my mind shifts to that bad moment and I lose my concentration about what it is I'm looking for. That's some things that I wrestle with. That scar tissue, you start worrying about like that piece of meat. Okay. You eat a steak, you get a little piece of meat between your teeth. What happens? If you don't have flaws to get it out, your tongue keeps going right back to it. You can't, you can't really listen to somebody talking to you and you're, yeah, you're nodding your head and you're, yeah, I hear what you're fucking saying, but you're just trying to get that little piece of fucking meat between your teeth out. That's what scar tissue is like when you're trading with bad experiences, you will go back to those things where it hurt you before and you won't be able to focus clearly without any confusion or any kind of distraction about the very trade you're in. That's is why I teach you the way I teach you. I don't want you and you don't want, you just don't realize you don't have that problem. And if you have the problem, you're nodding your head right now. You're like, I know exactly what the fuck you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I wish I would have known this beforehand. But once you have it, you can't do anything but live with it. It makes it harder to be a trader like that. It's difficult to do that. And the way I teach and how I teach with a demo account, you can't get that problem. It's impossible for you to get that problem. Why fucking people have an issue with this shit, whether it's a demo or not? Because literally, it's the same fucking thing. The people that are following my shit when I'm on, on Twitter and I'm saying it's going to go here and they buy it and they make money. You think they give a fuck about whether I talked about it in a demo or not? They made money on it. They watched it unfold. They don't give a fuck. They're also aware that every funded account out there is a fucking demo. So stop talking about fucking demos like it's a fucking problem. People are making money learning from me and studying in their own demo account. When they get comfortable with what they're looking at and they wrestle through all their bullshit and find out where their character flaws are. And they're honest with that. They make either a coping skill to work around it or correct it. It might be a, a substance abuse. Could be alcoholism. It could be you know smoking weed. If you're smoking weed and you're trading, you're fucking stupid. Okay, you're fucking stupid. 
You're literally dulling your fucking senses and you're fucking making it harder. Okay. You want to do that? Do that on the weekend. No markets, no none of that shit. Okay. You want to get high, get fucking lit, get baked, whatever the fuck you want to call it. On the weekend where you can't do anything or hurt yourself in the marketplace. You shouldn't smoke. It's going to tear your fucking lungs up. I don't care what anybody says. It's hurting your lungs. Edibles, have at it. But alcoholism, you don't want to be drinking. You don't want to have it anywhere near you while you're trading. <clears throat> I don't drink. I've never drank alcohol or got drunk, but I've seen the effects of it. And nobody, in my opinion, is going to effectively trade well <laughs> intoxicated. Okay, this is, this is not. And to try to be the person that proves me wrong there is stupid. So it might be as extreme as something like that that you're wrestling with. Or something as simple as, uh, you know, you just want to feel significant and you're impatient about it. And you want to do something right away because a win will make you feel significant. And most of the time, it's it's that. It's that, that very thing for men. For women, uh, they just want to feel confident that they don't have to rely on a secondary income, which will allow them to live their relationship with their significant other more honestly. Because unfortunately... Women sometimes are codependent on a male because they're the breadwinner. And if they help their household you know, stay afloat and they don't have enough to contribute to support it without them, they stay in relationships they otherwise wouldn't be in. And I'm not trying to false the idea of divorces or separations, but in some instances, certain relationships are not healthy for them to be in. It could be physically abusive. It could be mentally abusive. And they're trapped. And this skill set, when they learn how to do it, will allow them to weigh out whether or not this is a really healthy relationship. And honestly, if you want to know if a man really loves you, if you can make the money that supports the household and you still give him respect as the man, he's going to love you like a queen like you've never been before. Because he's going to know she don't need to be with me. Like she, she makes real bread and she chooses to be with me and she's monogamous with me and I'm content and I love this woman because – she could be somewhere else and she's choosing me. How's that for a life lesson? You got to think about it, young men, because a lot of times you, you, you're you thinking what's your dick, okay? And women aren't thinking what their dick. They're not thinking what your dick. They will manipulate you with your dick. And maybe you never thought I'd go there, but this is this is the reality of it, folks. People are human and relationships are manipulated. And sometimes we pretend we're in love just to cope. But when you start real, making real money, it might open your eyes up. Do you, do you really love the person you're with? Or are you just codependent? And are they really loving you like you should be loved? Because if you're not really bringing anything to the table, I can tell you most men, most men, don't view women as equal in a relationship. They, they just think that they should be subordinate all the time. And that's unfortunate because that causes the relationship to be lopsided. And subservient women, almost to a fault, will stay in that codependent relationship. And if you have the ability to make this kind of money independent of your spouse, it, it will force them to rise to the occasion and be a better man. Or you can escort them out the door and say, I really don't need you because you're, you're holding this family unit back. You're welcome to be a part of this family and i want you to be a part of this family but if you're doing if you're going to be toxic or if you're not going to be um wholesome we, we don't need you we, we we don't need your paycheck and a real man would see that and identify that and say you know what this this is a queen this is a woman that i want to be with this is someone that would love they would treasure this woman i have her right now and i have not been giving her like that's how i feel i'm talking right out of my heart right now like i have a good wife I have a good wife and I would hate. Now, I, I mean, I don't think I've been a terrible husband and I've done what a husband should do, obviously. And we share time together, but she wants more of it. And it's not wrong for, for her to want more of it. And it's not selfish for her to want more of it. And I'm making myself available. She's been very forgiving and allowing me to spend the time with all of you and doing the things that I do with you. But she knows there's a, there's a deadline. So she's comfortable with that. 
And I've never given her a deadline where I said, I'm going to be done. I, I, it is done in November. The second week of November, we're done. In 2023, ICT is done. I, I will not be doing these types of things anymore. And I want you to know that I will be happy not doing these things because I will be doing the things I should have been doing more of with my wife and my children. And I want you to learn that from me. Don't repeat it. Don't do the, don't discover how painful it is for me, for yourself having done the same things. Don't do that. Do a better job of balancing your personal life. That's the whole reason why I put that 1440 video series up. It's not a filler. Like that, that's valuable information. I wish I would have learned that in my 20s. I would have been much more effective, much more affluent, successful, and more at peace and wouldn't have had all the anxiety I created in myself with all this shit. Success is easy to get. It's hard to manage. If you're not prepared for it mentally, it's, it's very, very hard. And if you're a person that is... I'm trying to say this because I, I, I don't want to sound bigger than I am because I'm really not that big of a deal. But I'm cognizant of the fact that the level of recognition I am getting now, I'm uncomfortable with it. And you have to make allowances for that because if it's your pursuit to become you know, somebody in this industry, be prepared to not want it when it's being introduced to you because it's it's something that i have discovered you know when i was younger i would have never imagined feeling the way i feel about it now but i feel adamant i i'm, I'm i don't want to be someone like that and i mean to the average person walking around out here if i went into a store they're not going to say oh yeah that's that guy in a circle trader but someone that's in trading like forex and whatever um they may recognize me they say hey look you know there's aren't you ict or, or if they hear me talking and say hey, you know whatever that hasn't happened thankfully <laughs> but uh i i don't want it to happen because I, I would really be uncomfortable and the one student that i have that is a is a student of mine i asked he asked rather if he could meet me and i met him in the parking lot of my high school and if he was honest and he was here, he would tell you he could clear you could clearly see I was uncomfortable. But it was an ulterior reasons for me to have that meeting too. But um, putting that aside, I, I I'm very introverted. I may not sound like I'm introverted when I get on these spaces because I let myself just tear up and go. <laughs> but uh, in in public, I'm wrestling with myself all the time, and that's what causes me to be introverted because. My mind is racing a thousand miles an hour and there's a, a thousand intrusive thoughts going in my head all the time. So imagine you are approached by someone that just simply wants to say hi to you or meet you or, or just say thank you very much. It would be unsettling for me because I, I, I first of all, I don't know who you are Two, um, the way the world is today. You, know, you could use that just to get close enough to me and hurt me or my family. And you're going to die if you did that. <laughs> just letting you know that you will, you will be ventilated. Okay. Don't, don't do that type of thing because I don't know what your intentions are. And I don't want that. I'm not having an open invitation for people to come in and, and want to shake my hand and meet me. And I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. Not because I wouldn't appreciate it nor, or, I'm against you having that experience. I just don't feel comfortable. And I think if you really put some thought behind it, you would appreciate what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. Because it's just, you know, I'm I'm a person with a family and I don't want anybody close to my family that could potentially hurt them. And anybody would be like that. So anyway, I'm done. So hopefully you got something from it. If not, at least I helped you get through your day a little bit if you were doing some yard work or whatnot, give you something to listen to. Maybe give you some things to think about. For those that are YouTube channel operators, I gave you a task if you choose to accept it. And I covered some things that uh, hopefully would align you with um, what it is that you have to wrestle with as a trader. Like it's a lot more than just what you see in the chart and what you expect to see in price action. So with that, my friends, 
I will wish you a very, very pleasant Memorial Day. If you're celebrating it, you know, be safe. Don't drink and drive. And I will touch base with you tomorrow, Lord willing. Until then, be safe.